podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first part of the Off-Grid Masterclass web series. My name is Andrew, and I'll be moderating. We will be starting here very shortly, but before we begin, there are a few things we must go over. Remember, it is very important to please be logged into the webinar through your own connection. Uh, this is required so that in the event that Half Moon Education or you are audited by a licensing board that we're able to accurately prove your attendance. Also, it's the only way for you to gain access to the brief quiz at the end of the program, which is a requirement if you're trying to obtain continuing ed credits. Uh, next, I wanted to mention to the right of your screen that you'll see a panel. And towards the bottom of this panel, you'll see a dark gray questions bar. If you double click this, it will open and allow you to submit any questions you may have during the webinar. Please feel free to ask any questions at any time and we'll be answering them as soon as we can. Um, if by chance you should happen to lose sound during the webinar, please see the audio tab that's on the panel and you'll have the option to dial in with your phone. For anything else that might come up, please call Half Moon's customer service, and that's going to be at 715-835-5900, and I'll post that number for everybody in the chat section. Uh, with all that being said, I'd like to welcome and hand the microphone over to our wonderful series speaker, J.R. Cromer. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. I'm going to put my email address in the chat box for everyone to have. Okay, welcome to uh, the residential off-grid masterclass. This is going to be a pretty jam-packed program today. Um, so we're going to talk about some reasons why uh, customers would would go off-grid um, to, to begin with. And the answer might surprise you. Uh, there, there are many cases where going off-grid is the cost-effective answer. It's just that um, you know those aren't your standard customers. They generally live in more rural areas. Uh, we'll talk about electrical analysis and how to kind of approach uh, off-grid battery bank sizing by looking at the electric bill. Uh, we're going to talk about battery selection, you know, lithium ion versus versus lead acid, um, some popular options. We'll talk about inverters and components and uh, the, the layout of the battery room. Uh, tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit about some advanced solar racking uh, techniques and generally the reason why you're living off grid, you're, you might want to do it yourself and knowing some of my installation techniques for good cable management might help you uh, if you are are doing it, uh, a solar self-installing a solar project talk about generators how they integrate into uh, off-grid renewables uh, talk a little bit about wiring diagrams and how things are you know actually wired up what it looks like uh, behind the uh, panel. Um, we'll talk about smart home load management, which is becoming one of my favorite topics to talk about. So we're going to have to move through this class pretty fast so that we have plenty of time to talk about this subject. Uh, but essentially, we're using home automation to control electrical loads. And it has uh, use. In my case, I use it for grid tied time of use metering. Um, I just saved, I don't know, about $30 on my last month's electric bill through digital controls. Uh, for off-grid, we use digital controls to keep the home electronics within the uh, design parameters of the system so that you don't you know, overload your system and have all of your electronics turn off. So I think that's pretty interesting. We'll get to that. And then uh, by the end of the program, we'll have taken our combined knowledge to say, Okay, we can start, you know, putting off-grid systems and components together, and actually building a, a system that works together uh, that might be more than the sum of its parts. Uh, whereas the current kind of off-grid design philosophy is to stay within one manufacturer's product line uh, to, you know, make sure you have a smooth user experience. And sometimes that means you can't get everything you want. So by the end of the program, we will have developed a comprehensive outlook towards off-grid design and site selection. 
Um, so a lot on our plate. <laughs> Let's start out by uh, putting out some arguments against the grid. Um, we're going to go a little fast on this so we can get more into some technical detail. Um, but uh, effectively, power companies are required to bring um, electric service out to the properties that they service, provided that the point of interconnection is, you know, for example, out on the side of the street, you know, somewhere where there's an easement, somewhere where it's readily accessible, and the power does not have to be brought really that far into the property line. It's just hooked up to the, uh, you know, the utility transformer on the ground or up on a pole uh, at the side of the building. Um, but in the cases where power is not already on the property, or even in the cases where it's just a big property, you know, a farmer buys uh, 40 acres of land and wants to live right in the middle of it, uh, you know, you still have to bring the power out to where it's going to go. And that is what can get quite costly. So, you know, when you're looking at building, you know, half a mile into the property, you can be looking at interconnection costs that uh, are, are equivalent to the cost of, you know, a nice sized lithium ion battery bank and battery inverter. And so in those cases where the, the cost of grid expansion is exorbitant, you know, off grid becomes, you know, the most cost effective way to generate your power. And that really should surprise no one. Um, but, you know, it's just a, a nice reminder that, you know, underground line, the distribution line, they do have real costs. And uh, so I just thought you know, I'll include some numbers at the front of the program so that you can you know, see underground is, is much more costly, although uh, in certain rural areas, you know, underground cable is, is not that big of a deal. Uh, once you get into a more urban environment, uh, the costs can go up substantially. You know, no big surprise there. Yeah, another thing to take away from this slide is that overhead power lines are uh, cheaper than underground power lines, at least, you know, up front. And so, you know, we that's generally why we do overhead power lines. And there are power issues associated with that that lead to grid unreliability. And so the, the interest of having cheap electricity uh, we do make some grid reliability choices about our, our grid infrastructure, and sometimes those choices are too cheap. And so in particular in rural areas, uh, you get into having more power outages than you do uh, inside the city. And so in rural areas, you might be wanting to live off grid because you lose power you know, six times a year and you're just wanting something a little bit more reliable. You might not have to go fully off grid for that. Um, we're going to get to that. You know, there are some areas where just being tied to the grid is quite costly. In fact, in, in Mississippi, my meter rate is $35 a month plus a $5 membership. Well, I think that's just because it's my first time. Um, month. I just joined an electrical co-op. My meter fee is $35 a month. So the instant, you know, I use one kilowatt hour of electricity for the whole month, my bill's, you know, $35 and five cents or something like that. It's a huge fixed fee. Um, here are some electric rate structures where the meter fee can exceed $50 a month. Um, so that's kind of interesting because that's that's where the future is headed is keeping the energy rate cheap and increasing the fixed costs of grid connection. And so at, at what point do you say, OK, I'm done with with being grid interconnected. I'm going to pay that meter fee. You know, for a lot of customers, you know, they'll they'll grumble, but they'll still pay, you know, forty dollars a month to be connected to the grid. 
And so here are some of the, the highest just standard meter fees for regular residential electric rates that I've found. Uh, if you know of any ones that are higher than this, let me know. But it, it turns out that that rural electric cooperatives are the ones with these high fixed fees. And there's a good reason for that. You know, these cooperatives have fewer customers per mile of power line serviced. And so they, you know, they incur higher distribution costs and these fixed fees are a way for the grid distributors to uh, recoup that cost regardless of the consumption of the customer. And, uh, you know, solar already has uh, fair market value issues. Uh, in, in many areas across the United States, there's a policy called net metering where the solar buyback rate is near retail price. In Mississippi, uh, they define net metering to be pretty much the opposite of that. They say, okay, Mississippi's net metering policy is you only get about 20% of retail value for your electricity. Uh, and that's our net metering policy. That's that's the instant you export onto the grid. And so, you know, solar to offset, you know, 100% of a load profile, and it's only on for about a third of the day. So, you know, maybe three quarters of a solar array's production that is intended to generate 100% of a building, three quarters of that production, you know, is either sold to the grid or needs to be used or or stored in a battery it's it's not used when it's being produced and so um if the grid says we're only going to buy that for for pennies of what we charge you you know then all of a sudden solar is not a very good deal in fact uh you know the the idea is okay well that's why you buy a battery to store that electricity um what we'll learn in class today is batteries cost money too. They're not free. In fact, they're expensive and they have a limited life. And so when you buy a battery and you use it, you're incurring a cost. And sometimes the cost of using the battery is greater than that differential between the buyback rate and, and what you would, you know, what it would cost you to charge the battery with grid power uh, or, or, or even charge it with free power and just use the battery, the, the cost of using the battery can be greater than the savings opportunity. So, uh, you know, the utility rate structures, sometimes there's opportunities to take advantage of them. And other times, you know, it's not the utility who's being taken advantage of. Um, and so what's interesting about my neck of the woods in the Southeast United States, we generally have pretty bad solar policy. And uh, the end result is, you know, a grid tied solar array does not make the uh, very much money. And so there's not a lot of grid tied solar. Uh, and the only market that remains in that circumstance is off grid. So in, you know, as, as batteries, Costs have come down, more and more batteries start being implemented into the job site. And eventually we get to the point where we don't need to worry about grid policy anymore because, you know, a solar array without a battery is is an incomplete system. It's just that in, in many cases, the batteries do not improve economics and often they do not improve grid tied residential economics. Um, as far as selling or storing solar energy being outflowed onto the grid, you know, often the best economic decision is to sell the power back to the grid at the bare bones price that the grid is buying it back at rather than storing it into a battery because the cost of storage is so high. Now, that's a very specific residential rate structure. We're going to show you how to evaluate some of those costs uh, in class. Uh, 
you know, this this cost is saying, but they're, you know, the, the solution could be let's install a bunch of small solar arrays on all the homes, but there's some economies of scale to a solar project where a, you know, eight kilowatt, one pallet solar project uh, does not take that much more effort than a, you know, one third of a pallet solar project. So solar arrays do want to be large and you know, it only takes about two pallets of solar to power a home, larger homes, maybe three. And so, you know, it's not when you it's the cost of the batteries rather than the cost of solar. That's the limiting feature to off grid here. Um, you know, what's what's kind of insidious is the you know, the higher those fixed fees go the and the less electricity you use on site because you're generating solar and you're storing it in a battery you know the 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 more expensive the gr electricity that you buy from the grid becomes and so you know i think that it's important for every solar home to even if they're not doing a full 100 percent off-grid conversion today or anything close to that you know, at least think about in terms of project planning, if this building did go completely off grid, how much of the roof would be covered in solar? Sometimes the answer might be all of it. You know, and also with regard to the battery room and the electronics, you know, how much space would be required of this home if it were a fully off-grid home in terms of where to house those things. So we're going to explore some of those situations in class. Um, you know, what is, what is funny about uh, the Southeast United States where uh, the policies are particularly bad uh, for consumer owned solar is that these are monopolies and down the road in Houston, Texas, where they don't have any renewable mandates or subsidies, they just have a deregulated electric grid you can get better solar buyback rates than you can, you know, on a utility monopoly, you know, that's a member owned cooperative. Um, you know, the, the Tennessee Valley authority, and I'm going to get off the soapbox real quick, but in their, their, you know, rate change reports, uh, they come out and say that they're going to start charging solar array owners an increasingly larger amount for the right to interconnect a solar home to the grid under the same premise as a tax on electric vehicles for road maintenance. You know, they use less of the grid uh, than the others, and so they should pay additional costs uh, because of that is the mindset and so the answer you know the we might see a future where even if you had a solar array that's not interconnected to the grid the power company would still charge you a solar discriminatory rate structure simply because your home uses less electricity than its neighbors and there are examples of that happening in the united states today uh this is my electric cooperative <laughs> And, uh, you know, they, they actually have a great time of use rate structure. So I, I live in an apartment and I don't, um, you know, I don't have a solar array. I don't have a backup battery uh, in my apartment. And uh, so they have a time of use rate structure that I take advantage of. I use my same solar monitoring system just to control my appliances during their time of day rate. And it saves me a good amount of money. So, you know, I'm not trying to say these are, are the, the dinosaurs of the industry. They have a great, innovative time-of-use rate structure for their customers. Their solar program is terrible. Um, they bill the solar customer, in addition to this you know, uh, $35 a month meter fee, they bill the solar customer an additional $15 a month to be a part of their solar program. And then they buy the electricity at the state's avoided cost rate, and then they subtract out a penny a kilowatt hour from the avoided cost, which is only a couple of pennies to begin with, uh, for what they call a, a wheeling charge, since that 
electricity flows through their grid, which is like the strictest letter of the law interpretation governing solar buyback rates uh, that a power company could approach is, you know, okay, we're forced to buy back the electricity, but it's only at avoided cost and we're entitled to an administrative fee. And this is how we're breaking out our administrative fee, a fixed fee and a quantitative per kilowatt hour fee and and uh, the the net effect of this fee and recouped through avoided cost buybacks to the cooperative is the solar customer would have to expand the size of the array by four kilowatts and effectively just give it to the power company in order to overcome the added cost of solar discriminatory fees levied against a home that has solar on it in this this part of the grid. So at that point, you start ticking customers off and they say, and if they have deep enough pockets, they start saying, you know, forget you guys, I'm gonna just go off grid entirely. And if they don't have deep enough pockets, they still try and, you know, have as much of their cake and eating it too as possible. You know, maybe they just try to zero down their electric bill just down to that fixed fee and say i've done all i can do and and begrudgingly admit that having a grid connection is actually quite convenient and should be taken advantage of the grid does fail um what these charts show is is effectively there's you know there's fun debates about whether overhead wire or underground wire is is best um but but by and large the the overhead wires cause more power outages than the underground because they're more exposed uh, to damage and not area not in every area can you do underground um, for that matter like right on the coastline um, and 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 the reason why I just mentioned that is a hey, the grid's unreliable people have solar on their homes uh, and they they lose power and then they can't use their solar array because the solar array is connected to the grid and there are safety provisions uh, built into it. So if they're repairing power lines, you don't electrocute uh, service personnel. And, and so at some point that, that solar array owner who's losing power during a blackout says, okay, well, I've heard you can add batteries to a solar array. How do you do it? And uh, the simple fact of the matter is that the, the grid tied systems that have battery you know, backup options still aren't very good. Um, you're still having to isolate the system from the grid during a power outage. And so there still needs to be a transfer switch and it's only a small battery to begin with. And so these battery based grid tied inverters, when they back up a home, they're only backing up a few circuits. And that circuit that they back up is generally, you know, just large enough to power an air conditioner by itself and that's it. And, and so they, they say, okay, we'll back up everything else. We'll back up your garage door. We'll back up your refrigerator, you know, some light bulbs, but you're not going to have your air conditioning and you can't run both at the same time. Well, now I grew up from Texas. I would rather lose my internet access and cell phone access than air conditioning. It just becomes unbearable. So if I'm doing a solar battery, you know, I want to run it, I want to run an air conditioner on it. And a lot of your, your smaller grid tied battery backup options, such as the Tesla Powerwall, you know, just one of those by itself is not powerful enough to run your air conditioner. And so the the grid tied options are are not necessarily that great for supplying power to an entire house. And there's some compromises you can make with that. You know, okay, well, you know, I'll have my solar battery back up some critical loads, but then I might also have a generator. And so I can choose if to have the extra power I need to run an air conditioner, something like that. Uh, there's 
air conditioners now that plug directly into the solar array. And so you could say, okay, well, I'll have air conditioning, you know, when the sun's up and my solar array's working and not at night, and it'll be better than nothing. Uh, but the nice thing about, you know, uh, uh, and, and here there's some interesting ways to interconnect backup systems into a grid-tied home. Uh, one of the cheapest ways to do it is to put this manual interlock switch. Um, and so, so for ex example, the uh, solar edge store edge solar inverter. It's a grid tied battery inverter, and it it only backs up a a 25 amp circuit. And of course, we know, well, that could actually, you know, back up multiple circuits, provided they all don't run at the same time. But if more than uh, 25 amps per pole you know, gets pulled through this breaker, well, then, then your backup loads all stop because the breaker trips. And so you could install a critical load panel and put, you know, your critical loads on that. And that would be the safest way to do it. Here's a, a generator interlock switch. And so if you want to just plug in an undersized generator to your service panel, you know, to power your whole house during an emergency, you know, there's a, a cheap way to do that. And what's, what's interesting is you can take the solar edge store edge circuit and instead of landing it on a critical load panel, you can loop it back around and land it at the top of your bus bar and use the backup capability to power your whole house. But what do you what do you lose in that? Well, this is an automatic breaker. This is a manual transfer switch. So now you lose the automatic backup load because you've put in a manual transfer switch in the process. So, you know, the what what I'm trying to say here is like the the battery inverter grid tied option you know, it's very difficult to make that back up your whole house. It's not that you can't go outside the manufacturer's, uh, maybe their warranty, and rewire the system on a different kind of transfer switch and boot up your whole house with it. You would still have to manage your energy. Otherwise, you're going to run out of juice. Um but it's complicated. It's not like you're just buying a battery inverter and a solar inverter and your grid tied and the grid goes out and you get to use your power. You still need to design a, a appropriate switch gear to isolate your self-stored, self-generated power from backflowing onto the grid. Because if the grid's offline, it's because there's an emergency going on somewhere. All right, so batteries are expensive. Um, you know, if you went with with like a, a Tesla Powerwall, it's not enough to back up your whole house. It's also not enough to power your whole house. So there's not enough energy. There's not enough power. So what's it for? It's providing a little bit of backup power. You know, like, uh, you know, you know, maybe not even a full day's worth, maybe just a couple hours. Uh, this slide is is just to say, uh, you know, the, the lithium ion batteries are generally a high voltage and low amperage, whereas lead acid is typically low voltage and high amperage. It's a little bit more cost effective to go with high voltage and low low amperage. So, um, you know, you get into smaller gauge cable is the, the primary advantage. You get into these lead acid batteries and your your cables can become quite large, you know, three aught, four aught cables for residential off-grid battery banks. You know, anything larger than that, uh, you start, it starts not to become very feasible. Um, Whereas the home, you know, even if you wire up a 48, a 12 volt flooded lead acid into a 48 volt bank, you're still having to get it up to 120 volts or 240 volts for your residential service. Uh, it's more efficient to take 
high voltage solar and keep it in a high voltage battery and then deploy it at a high voltage um, uh, electric service panel. Whereas the lead acid low voltage uh, design parameters are more geared around motors uh, that only needed that low voltage. And so lithium ion batteries are a little bit better designed uh, to power an entire house than lead acid. Uh, and we're going to spend more on that later. Uh, but uh, you know, long story short is there are customers out there that get a raw deal from their power company or from the power company's perspective. They get a fair deal from the power company. It's just that uh, many customers are not used to paying the full price of electric service uh, when they live inside a, a, a you know the 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 touch of the electric grid, you know, that, that service is, is just a, a standard part of grid operation. When you have to actually expand the electric grid and pay for it all yourself, you know, that's where off-grid solar becomes quite cost effective. Otherwise, it's probably best to do a small battery and, and kind of take advantage of that grid connection. And so I guess what we're saying is, is going off grid can be very uneconomic for some and very economic for others. Um, it, the next question is, okay, well, that's not that exciting. You know, what would it take for a whole house to go off grid, even if it didn't need to? Just so you could have your, you know, certainly some home buyers are willing to pay for high end functionality. Um, sometimes that doesn't make economic sense as they want the security more than anything else. You know, people have different reasons for their electric use. You know, if people are on medical equipment, you know, they care more about their electrical reliability, as should the designer and installer of the system. <laughs> Um, but if you have, you know, if you work from home, if you have, uh, you know, I, I meet scientists from time to time who don't want to lose power to their equipment and they, anyway, um, why don't we start by determining what are the, some, some sizes for battery banks for off-grid homes? Let's determine what the costs look like, uh, before we decide if it's a, a good thing or not. Um, uh, often you're only going to have month to month numbers of elect. These are my past 12 months of electric usage. It might be a new construction where they say, this is my past 12 months of electric usage. Uh, except we're going from a gas house to an all electric house and it's being built with energy efficiency and it's a little smaller than our current house. So, you know, what do you think our electric bill will be? No, I, I don't know. Uh, generally, with off-grid, you will oversize rather than undersize. At any rate, uh, this is our 12-month electric bill history. And, and the thing to keep in mind is your electric load varies throughout the day. And so... Uh, you know, we what this is a, a software called Aurora Solar, and what they've done quite nicely here is uh, it's hard to read, but this has pool, electric vehicle, air conditioners, heating, hot water, and and what you're seeing is is okay. Your your home is being heated uh, in the morning, and then the sun comes up, and the heating goes down in the afternoon and maybe the air conditioner clicks on and this is like hot water heating. Well then here's here's hot water and you know all this this stuff. This is in the, the summertime where you have more load towards the end of the day rather than the beginning. But these are all just assumptions. <laughs> you know I was able to with my smart home tell my thermostat to turn the air conditioner off at 6 a.m. and turn it back on at 8 a.m. and it's hardly noticeable uh, in terms of comfort level, 
but it, it completely avoids my electric rate. So in my electric load, right around 6 a.m. when Aurora would say most homes have their peak, I actually have the opposite. I have a big giant valley because I'm using digital controls for that. Um, the point is that even if, you know, let's say you take your monthly rate, one way to start analyzing that is to break out your monthly usage into daily usage, you know, how many days are in the month, and then you know how many hours in the day, and you can divide that and get your hourly average usage. But your hourly average usage is going to be somewhere around here, and your peak usage can be substantially greater than that. And on top of that, this is data that's broken out by, you know, every, you know, half an hour. If you went to a 15-minute granularity or even a five minute granularity, you know, electrical loads become quite spiky. Um, so we're going to get uh, more on that in a minute. But they're, what they're doing here in this survey, what's important about it is they're, they're looking at all of the heavy electrical appliances in the house and making a real thorough list of that. You know, I had a, a off-grid house where, you know, they're using uh, high-end energy-efficient heat pumps, and these heat pumps normally operate at, at 3 kilowatts of power, 4 kilowatts of power or so. Um, but inside the heat pump, there is an electric heating strip that – is 10 kilowatts in size for each of them. Now there was an option to get this strip down at five kilowatts in size, but you know no one picked that up. And so you know the electric heating strips come on, and all of a sudden this home load, which is normally five or six kilowatts, skyrockets up to 35, 40 kW. So if you don't have 35, 40 kW of inverter capacity, you know the system's going to turn off. And so you really need to look at all of your heavy duty electrical appliances, you know, what is their maximum load and then come up with a game plan of, you know, okay, what kind of load shifting can we do to make sure that the uh, swimming pool pump doesn't come on at the same time as the air conditioner. So that gets more into the home automation stuff uh, that we'll get into tomorrow. Sizing the solar array though, can be spitballed based off the monthly consumption data. You know, as can the size of the battery bank as well, because you know the battery bank is more concerned about having enough energy and not running out. And so your 15 minute load versus your one hour load are less important when you're trying to store, you know, uh, a day's worth or two or three days worth of power. You know, and, and likewise with the solar array, there are going to be cloudy days and there are going to be sunny days. So there's going to be days where you're overproducing and days when you're not producing enough. And so we just need to start analyzing those kinds of days. But it's safe to assume that at the end of the month, you always want to be back to your starting point. You don't, you don't want to get to the end of the month having lost electricity. Uh, out of your battery bank. You want that battery bank to be fully charged for most days of the year. And so what we do in, in solar, let's say I had a customer who was 100% net metered. Um, we take their monthly bills, and we can see down at the bottom of this graph here, we get to 17,000 kilowatt hours of, of, kilo, of energy consumed. And if he was getting a dollar for dollar credit for each kilowatt hour that he produced, we'd say, okay, well, you know, a 12 and a half kilowatt solar array produces 17,000 kilowatt hours of electricity a year. And so buy this 12 and a half kilowatt solar array and it will offset 100% of your electric bill. And then uh, maybe if he only had a month-to-month -month net metering policy, instead of offsetting 100% of his bill, we'd say, okay, well, in, in April, you, you only 
uh, consume 920 kilowatt hours. And so, you know, if you just wanted to kind of hit a sweet spot and project size, you know, just one pallet of solar on a month to month net metering makes a lot of good sense. You know, if you had no net metering, you know, not getting anything for your outflow, you know, then maybe you just stick to a small solar array. And off grid, you have to oversize. You have to say not, you know, am I generating enough energy to offset my use at the end of the year? I would say, do I, am I generating enough to get through at the end of the month? And so you really want to look at the, the winter electric bills and separately the summer electric bills. Now in summertime, you know, your solar array produces more than in the winter time. And so here, you know, I'm I'm kind of saying, okay, um, you know, my my critical time here is is kind of in, in August and July. I'm just generating just a little bit more than what I'm consuming. Um, and then, and then in the winter time, I'm kind of right on the edge too. So, you know, 18 kilowatts is kind of the sweet spot where my, my winter production is, is always greater than my consumption and my summer production is always greater than my summer production. And what that means is there's going to be times in the middle of the year, you know, in March and April when solar production is, is incredible and electric consumption is low um, where you're just going to have an overabundance of electricity in an off-grid system. I mean, that's just, uh, you might think, oh, I have so much electricity. What fun stuff can I do with my extra electricity? Uh, but there's going to be a lot of times where, where an off-grid array, you're going to be generating surplus. Now, on the solar end of things, the good news is it's you can really start saving money by doing ever increasing larger solar projects. So, you know, uh, um, a three pallet solar array does not cost uh, three times as much as a one pallet solar array. It might cost twice as much as a one pallet solar array. So, um, you know, uh, the, the, the general good, uh, if you gave yourself a $2 a watt project budget for an 18 kilowatt array, just for the, the solar side of things, you know, that's a, a very easily achievable price for a, a construction inclined uh, person self-managing their project. And so the, the, the takeaway from that last bit is, you know, design the solar array so that at the end of the month, your production at the end of the month is always greater than your production consumption at the end of the month. And, I, and it kind of depends on your region on how much of an oversize that is compared to a net metered home. So the next design question is, how do you determine how many days in a row you go without solar production? And it's a nuanced question because there are overcast days when your solar array produces electricity. And then there are overcast days when the clouds are just thick enough to keep the array from turning on at all. So how do you determine between a lightly overcast day and a heavily overcast day. Well, for that, we use the software PV Watts. And so PV Watts, we've seen it in other solar programs. It's online, it's free, it's easy to use. Uh, but the main point is at the end of PV Watts, you can download this hourly weather data. And that gives you an, an hour by hour printout for every hour of the year how much the array is going to produce. So right here, the array is not doing anything because it's January 1st at 1 o'clock in the morning and uh, the sun's not up, no solar production. But then the sun comes up and we get some solar production. Within PV Watts, you can look at the beam irradiance column or the diffuse irradiance column. So here's a day where we have a lot of beam irradiance and very little diffuse irradiance. 
And then here's a separate day where, you know, at, at 10 in the morning, we're clipping along here at 930 watts out of 1,000. And so at, at the same time on December 9th instead of December 1st at, at 11 a.m. in the morning, we're at zero beam irradiance and 140 to 100 diffuse, whereas before we were at... 800, 900 beam and 60 diffuse. Now we're at no beam and 40 to 100 diffuse. You know, it's an overcast day. Now this is showing us maybe the clouds come out very slightly for an hour, but what we see here is the performance difference between a completely overcast day and a sunny day. So PV Watts is telling us if the day is a sunny day or if the day is a cloudy day. And we can analyze it to say, okay, well, you know, on a, <laughs> on a sunny day, I produce this much power. A few days later, it's a cloudy day. I produce that much power. And it turns out, hey, on, on cloudy days, you know, I can still pick up, you know, 30, 40% of what I did on sunny days. And so if I just doubled my array size and ignored all the surplus electricity, then even on overcast days, they still might produce enough electricity for me to get by. And it might be that my electric use is down on overcast days too. But there will still be some cloudy days that the clouds are so thick that doubling the array size, you know, maybe on a doubling the array size on a, on a partly cloudy day could turn it into a nice productive day. But doubling the array size on a day when the array hardly turns on at all is still just going to give you very tiny uh, production, you know, otherwise. So, yeah, at some point, just doubling the array size and doubling the array size and doubling the array size, you're still going to get these valleys where you might run out of electricity because, the array could be infinitely large. If it's not producing any electricity, it's not producing any electricity. So there is some diminishing returns you get into an off-grid design with making the solar array too large. Although in general, the solar array is going to be larger than a 100% net metered solar array. Well, I guess here we're just describing the previous discussion. You know, so so I guess what we're trying to illustrate here is if the, the batteries are full when they hit this green line, well, then we get to a partly cloudy day or a partly cloudy day where the batteries might not get full. But then there's other days when the batteries get full and we have all this extra electricity that we're not doing anything with that's just kind of wasted because there's nowhere to, to put it or push it. And if we doubled the size of the battery of the solar array, our, our solar array would get full much more quickly. And there would be certain days, that partly cloudy days, that would still fill up the battery bank. But then there would still be other, you know, days that don't. We would have to, you know, not double the array size, but, you know, quintuple the array size in order for you know, sunny, overcast weather to really not impact the building. What that means is if you're, if you're looking at your hourly consumption, and if you don't know your hourly consumption data, you can estimate it just like Aurora does. You can divide it by, the, you can take your monthly consumption bill, divide it by days in the month, divide it by hours in the day, and then smudge it around a, a little bit, making it higher during peak times and lower at night, if you so choose. You're gonna get more granular detailed hourly performance data from PV watts for your solar production, and so, you know, if you know your daily consumption, you know your, you can guess your battery bank size, you know your production, start with your battery bank size, subtract out the consumption, add in your production value, and you're able to chart whether or not the battery is full or not. Uh, this is using commercial solar design software that does this called Energy Toolbase. 
And and the the takeaway is you want a battery in an off-grid setup that if there's a sunny day outside, you want that to pretty much fully recharge the battery. You don't you don't want to uh, mess around with with having to rely on multiple days of sunlight in a row to get the batteries fully charged up. Uh, but then there's going to be days when that's just impossible because you get multiple days in a row without, or the days where a separate issue where you get multiple days in a row without sunlight. And you might think, okay, well, some oversizing is good for that. In this case, um, you know, a generator serves as backup, you know, for overcast weather. And so we're going to expand that design philosophy in a minute. Um, and, and so what I'll do is I'll plot all of this data, the PV watts data, the consumption estimates into an Excel sheet. And, and chart it out and look at, you know, when is the battery's lowest state of charge. And what this, what this really means from a high-level design standpoint is uh, we, we haven't really looked at the cost of gas yet, but uh, generally speaking, the solar electricity is going to be less costly than the cost of gas, um, both of which might be used to charge and cycle the battery. Um, and, and what that means is, and, and furthermore, PV watts is giving you typical weather data. It's not accounting for something like a hurricane that comes through and puts clouds in the sky for two weeks solid. And a lot of off-gridders, you know, they're they're wanting to be prepared for hurricanes. And so, um, you know, you you are going to have a gas generator to play free safety. And if you are designing your battery bank under a normal PV watts weather year to you know not rely on the generator for more than a couple of days out of the year you're going to be just fine. We're going to get more on that um, as we advance our design discussion. Now, so my recommendation is to treat the generator as backup only, not something that you need to rely upon. And the only exceptions would be, you know, when you get into the far north United States, you just get into such gloomy winters that, you know, the reliance on a generator is all the more present. A good way to, to counter that is to put in wood heat and get your, your heating bill off of the electric use, but that's kind of cheating in a way. Okay, so here's the process. We run our PV Watts hourly model. We go to the PV Watts website, we do our hourly solar performance estimate, and we kind of fine tune while we're there, you know, okay, well, every single month I need that much of electricity, so I need a 18 kilowatt array to generate all the power I need in the winter, all the power I need in the summer. Fine. Take your 18 kilowatt array, hourly data, export it from PV watts. We also want to make our 12 month consumption data and then we divide it to uh, into the number of days and then we divide it into hourly averages and you can apply the load profile data if you want. You're making the load higher in the day and lower in the middle of the night if you want. Yeah, that would that would only improve the model. Uh, to to more accurately reflect load shifting, uh, but you might also instill some overconfidence too because we're only building a model based on hourly data, and and you know your 15 minute by 15 minute loads can be much more spiky. 
Um, generally speaking, in off-grid design, spiky loads are the worst. And so anything like a 10 kilowatt heating element or 20 kilowatt heating element is, is particularly hard on these systems. And so here we've taken our, our consumption data and we've divided it by the days of the month to get uh, kilowatt hours per day. And now we have our average power draw per hour. And so we go into a, a spreadsheet and we take our PV watts system production. And when I do PV watts, I'll commonly model it at a 1000 watt system. And then I'll just add some tables to my Excel so I can change the production for a two kilowatt system or a 10 kilowatt system. So I can kind of fiddle with the variables to help me fine tune uh, my model. But I know my consumption data here. I'm just assuming a, a steady load throughout the day and night. Um, and I know that's not the, the most accurate uh, way to do it. But on the other hand, you know, my, my load being less at night is going to be easier on the batteries. My load being more during the day uh, might be more coincidental with a solar array. So, I'm not, I don't think I'm, I'm gonna, not going to beat myself too up over this. Uh, we don't have the building interval data, and the best thing you can do to kind of ensure a uniform load profile is implement some digital energy controls. And so here, I'm adding in a guess on my battery size. And so I'm guessing that I'm starting off with 120 kilowatt hour battery bank. And so I start off on January 1st at midnight with 120 kilowatt hours in the tank. And then my consumption is two kilowatts. And so it backs it out. And then 1 a.m. comes by, 2 a.m. comes by, 3 a.m. comes by. I keep backing out 2 kilowatt hours, 2 kilowatt hours, 2 kilowatt hours, 2 kilowatt hours, 2 kilowatt hours. And then on, you know, the, the sun starts to come up and presumably uh, we get on into the day. And so now the, the solar array is, is recharging the battery bank. And so by, it's a sunny day on January 1st by you know, midway through the day, my battery bank is fully recharged. And so I do that for every hour of the day. I say, okay, I'm starting off with 120 kilowatt hours of my battery bank size. I am subtracting my consumption. I am adding my production. And I say, what's the minimum size that my battery bank gets down to? And this is just imaginary. And so my imaginary battery bank says I get all the way down to negative 241 kilowatt hours of electricity. So, all right, well that's uh, you know, that's impossible. <laughs> I would, you know, what I would really need to have is a, a 360 kilowatt hour battery bank. That's quite expensive. Uh, you know, the, the Tesla batteries uh, cost $300 a kilowatt hour on up. And so, you know, you're looking at, uh, you know, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on these batteries. That's not feasible. Well, then I go and I say, okay, well, maybe an 18 kilowatt array is actually too small. You know, it, it helps to have a nice visual chart, such as what Energy Toolbase makes. But you can create these same charts in spreadsheets if you so choose. But, you know, being able to quickly visually assess, okay, well, when did I get down to the 241 bottom limit? And was that a, a summer day where I have high electrical loads and not a lot of sunshine? Or was it a winter day where I have even less sunshine and what do my loads look like then? And how do I recover out of it? 
And would that benefit from an increased array size? And so instead of doing an 18 kilowatt array, you know, I go and I select a, a 22 kilowatt array. And even though I downsize my battery bank even down to 90 kilowatt hours, I, I look through every line item. And because I increased my array size, my minimum battery level goes down to, you know, a less of a number. So I'm improving. I say, okay, well, you know, I, I now have a slightly larger array. And instead of needing a 360 kilowatt hour battery bank, I only need a 122 kilowatt hour battery bank. Or instead of needing a, yeah, so whatever. Um, and so that's why it's important to kind of build your own model and set up little toggles and look at the extremes, saying, okay, well, what is what is it if I need to, if I go from a, I went from an 18 to a, a, a 22, what would happen if I go from a 22 to a 28? And I can see is by by increasing my ray size from three pallets to four pallets, you know, I I can reduce my battery bank by another 30 kilowatt hours. So, you know, is that is that worth it or not? You know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, there's actually this is a, a typo right here. This number should be going from a 22 kilowatt to a 14 kilowatt, going from two pa three pallets down to two pallets. And we can see that number growed substantially. And so the, the point of this slide was to say, if you go from, you know, a 14 kilowatt array, your battery bank would need to be 760 kilowatt hours. Then you increase that by from two pallets to three pallets and go with 22. You know, you save 630 kilowatt hours out of your battery bank by doing a larger solar array. And then the next step up from going from three pallets to four pallets of solar, instead of saving 600 and something kilowatt hours, you only save 30 kilowatt hours. So you're, you're approaching the upper limit where increasing the array size further makes less sense. So I, I like kind of testing out these different extremes. And what that would mean is then I'll, then I'll go and test it out with the, the battery bank size too. And so here I've gone from a, a 90 kilowatt hour battery to 122, and I can see that you know all all I've done from that is is increase my battery bank size by 30 kilowatt hours and and eliminate the the bottom deficit. And so I'm kind of honing in on it, saying okay, uh, you know the really at this point. You know, I need to start spending money on my battery bank or I need to go take a look at what a generator could do for me. So a generator is playing free safety. And what would happen is not that my battery bank goes into negative kilowatt hours of storage. It would be at, at some point you know, when the battery gets down to a 20% depth of discharge or so, the generator cranks on and charges me all the way back up to the top again. And so in this, this model, which does not have the generator built in, I go through a cloudy day and a cloudy day and a cloudy day, and we can just see that it doesn't really matter how much solar would have been on the roof during this cycle because on this particular day, we're getting nothing out of our solar array. And so it really didn't matter how large of a solar array we had on the roof. By the time we get to through day one, day two, you know, by the time we get three days into our cloudy weather cycle, it's time to crank the generator. If we had an infinitely large battery bank, you know, we know that at the end of the month, we're catching back up at the end of the month because our solar array is sized enough. You know, all it takes is a few sunny days to get us, you know, all the way back up to the top. But if, you know, if this is, is reflective of 90 right here and this is reflective of negative 50, you know, what we're saying is without a generator, you know, our, our battery bank would need to be, you know, 90 plus 50 would need to be 140 kilowatt hours to to not need a generator, and that would be right on the nose. Generally, you don't size, you know, a, a critical 
function like electricity uh, to be right on the nose unless you have you know, millions of customers buying into one platform. Now here we have March and April, and we can say, okay, well, here's a, a kind of a cloudy weather cycle, you know, two days of clouds, one day of sun, three days of clouds, and the, the, the 90 kilowatt hour battery does just fine. We wouldn't need to, to charge a generator in, in other days. These are the, the sunny April days where we don't have any worries about electricity. Now, May through September, no big deal. Now, finally, we get to the end of the year and we start to see where our, our negative 122 event comes from. And there was another similar event right before that. And it's like, okay, we go one, two, three, four, you know, five days without power. And then we get back up into sunny days, which are the same days as these days, except on th at this time we have to recover the battery bank. You know, so so these days right in here when the battery bank is like fighting to recover itself, you know, they would be more akin to these days up at the top if we had taken a generator and at this point charged up all the way up to the top. And so at that point, you you just say, okay, well, you know, if I know, you know, I have a 90 kilowatt hour battery bank. I know my generator is going to turn on at a 20% depth of discharge. And if it turns on, we're not going to wait for the next sunny day to recharge the battery. We're just going to charge it all the way up to the top. Or you could say, no, we're just going to charge it up to 80% range. And so you get down to the sunny day, and then the generator drives it to the top. And then it kind of competes with the solar for the next few days. And then it, maybe the generator drives it to the top again. And then finally, a sunny day brings it all the way up to where it should be. But what we're saying is, you know, after you model your solar array and you take a guess at your battery bank size, and maybe you can model, you know, keep increasing the solar array until you get into diminishing returns on your minimum battery size. You know, at that point, the next step is to model your generator runtime. And so here we have a, a, a 15 kilowatt generator running at full power for one hour. And, and we have our battery level. It started off at 90, but during this storm cycle, it gets down to about 20. And so now we're, we're at the time that the generator needs to crank on. And so now the generator is charging the battery back up but not all the way to the top. You know, so this is, you know, the next step is to model generator runtime. And this is where like Energy Toolbase, a commercial design software falls short and modeling it in Excel is, or I use Google Sheets, is, is kind of the better way to do it is because there's not as there's not a lot of off-grid design resources available and so you're often having to build these models you know using your own expertise because none you know energy tool base they're focused on commercial batteries which has its own class with half moon and it's uh, a much more uh, lucrative application of battery technology so the commercial design software is chasing that application um, it's hard. You you can't model gas generator runtime in Energy Toolbase. It's it's worth building your own Excel model, spreadsheet model, uh, when doing off grid design. So here we are modeling our generator runtime. So the short of it is, we have um, some days in our off grid house where we have stranded electricity too much electricity we don't even know what to do with. It would be fun to have visual cues built into the home, like a water fountain running when the battery is at a healthy state of charge to visually indicate to the tenant that, you know, everything with their systems going great. They don't need to worry about energy usage at this time and, and other kinds of, of modes to, uh, 
you know, make them more aware and coach them with their electric use. It's, it's not just that they're going to be in energy poverty, but some days they're going to have a energy surplus. Hard to avoid a generator as backup. You know, I generally say only plan on using the generator a couple times a year. You know, don't make it a critical part of the system. You know, I, I only, you know, what, what I basically do is I look for this, this critical patch, you know, this one patch and say, okay, well, what do I need to do in terms of a generator runtime to get back up to the top? And so in my spreadsheet model, I think we'll get to this in a, a little bit, but I will go and calculate how many hours my, of the year my generator ran at full pass capacity and judge that against you know, the cost of gas to run the generator against the upfront cost of increasing the battery bank size. You can toggle you know, the, the battery bank size and reduce the generator runtime. Uh, as an economic optimization. Um, you know, the upfront cost of the batteries is going to be the biggest stumbling block. Um, a lot of the content in today's program is going to be focused on lead acid batteries. I've actually started to change my design philosophy, uh, which has always been heavy on industrial flooded lead acid for value. Um, at, at this point, I am, am giving stronger consideration to used lithium ion um, for off-grid applications because, uh, A, because it's cheaper than new lead acid and you buy new lead acid uh, because of reduced upfront cost. You know, there's some good pros to it. There's also some cons to it. So you take the the good, you take the bad with the good. Um, you need to look at your total storage capacity. You know, are you trying to live completely off grid or just get through a couple of hours of storage? If you are trying to live completely off grid, then you know, design the backup generator there to really be backup only being used a couple of times a year, not something that is going to need to be used every single day in the winter time to get you through. Obviously there's going to be environments like Alaska where that's not going to be feasible, but you know, we're talking about for, for most generally speaking. And then the, one of my off-grid customers said, you know, the thing I don't like about the generator, and obviously I'm going to have the generator in case I need it, um, but I don't want to have to listen to the generator and think that generator's running because I'm about to run out of electricity. <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to, to live off-grid and be stressed out about it. I'm trying to uh, live off-grid and, and not have to worry about things. And, you know, that kind of customer might be more willing to overspend on an oversized system than uh, another kind of customer who might want to live off grid. So let's, um, let's talk about batteries. A uh, few different metrics for analyzing batteries, uh, the, the one installers predominantly use is the, the cost per, per kilowatt hour. And so the you know, Tesla Powerwall, let's say it costs $10,000, and let's say it, it holds 10 kilowatt hours of electricity, which is not accurate, but that would be $1,000 a kilowatt hour of storage capacity. There's, there's another metric, which is the, the storage cycles. So it's, you know, not just, you know, how much weight can the elevator hold, but how many times can the elevator carry that weight up and down before it breaks? And that is, a, a, you would think it would be a more important aspect of batteries and storage, 
Um, the the only issue is the the longer the battery lasts, the more expensive it gets to pay up front. And so because, you know, batteries are not um, overly abundant in terms of grid storage, uh, we're not living in a world where, where batteries are so cheap that everyone's running out and getting them. We're, we're living in a world where people who want to have batteries have very either very specific niche market applications where batteries can be quite cost effective um, or they're looking for more general purpose and discovering that these things are still kind of expensive. So there is a, a um, even within lithium ion, there's a, a low shelf lithium ion and a top shelf lithium ion. And generally the, the low shelf lithium ion costs less money up front but doesn't last as long and therefore has a higher total cost when you count up all the cycles and still someone will buy the low shelf lithium ion because they'll say, you know, Hey, I, uh, it's better than lead acid. So this is all I can afford. <laughs> I'm, I'm tapping out. There's some spec sheets we're going to get into. The thing about lithium ion technology is the the specs are uh, less require less knowledge than lead acid. We're going to show you why in a couple slides. But here's the Tesla Powerwall. It has a 13 and a half kilowatt hour output, a five kilowatt continuous output. So what's interesting about that, and it says it's rated for self-consumption and backup power, and you know they have some off-grid capability as well. Uh, if my air conditioner has a 10 kilowatt heating element in it, and there are three of these energy efficient heat pumps on site, uh, and all 10, KWs per unit come on at the same time while other electrical loads are happening, my home load could spike up to 30 or 40 kilowatts pretty easily. And so I would need to provide five kilowatts of continuous output power. You know, I would need six to eight of these Tesla power walls and one Tesla power wall does cost, you know, 10 to $14,000 installed. So getting six to eight of them, you're looking at, you know, a hundred thousand dollar project. A lot of people say I can buy another house for that much. Well, you're not, you're buying batteries. They're different. You know, the point is, you know, maybe the, the Tesla product really isn't a product that's being aimed at whole house off grid. We need to learn a little bit more about it. But let's just do some price analysis and there's, you know, hey, what are you counting in here is is a valid question. But, you know, this is the the one Tesla Powerwall costing uh, the material cost is six thousand six hundred dollars when you look at what you need to buy for it. And it stores thirteen and a half kilowatt hours of electricity. So you can say the Tesla Powerwall costs $490 a kilowatt hour, um, you know, to, to purchase. I would actually peg that in at about half that uh, because you're also buying that five kilowatt inverter when you're doing the Tesla Powerwall, but we'll talk more about that later. I don't want to get too off from the slides. You know, the Tesla Powerwall is is rated, it's warranty. It actually has two different warranties. You know, the, the first warranty is for um, solar self-consumption slash backup only, which is where it is it is storing solar electricity during the day and slowly discharging the electricity at night and only otherwise being used during a power outage. So nice and easy usage. It'll say, we're going to give you a 10-year warranty. 
And it says any other application or combination of application, that's us, you know, off grid, your electric load spiking up and down, you're draining and recharging that battery, you know, with the solar array, with the generator, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of stuff with it. it says we're going to give you a 37,800 kilowatt hour warranty on the Tesla Powerwall. So if it, if the equipment of the Tesla Powerwall costs $6,600, then it's warranted for 37,800 megawatt hours of electricity. The value of that electricity is about 17 cents a kilowatt hour under warranty. And so that's where I'm like, okay, well, if, if the buyback rate from the grid is four cents and the, the cost to store it in a Tesla Powerwall and, and so that you don't sell it back is 17 cents, then you might as well just sell it for four cents. That's the more economic option. All right, so we said earlier that, that lithium ion batteries are, uh, the specs are less important than flooded lead acid. Um, these are a range of different batteries. So down at the bottom, this is like your entry level renewable lead acid. So when most people are talking about uh, renewable lead acid, they're talking about this blue line down here. The next step up is, is where you get into your premium renewable lead acid. So when you have a battery company out there saying that, man, our batteries are hands down, far and away, bar none, the best solar lead acid battery on the market, they're talking about this red line right here. This orange line is the kind of lead acid that I'm a big fan of. It's called an industrial flooded lead acid. This is more similar to forklift batteries. Um, they are not sealed batteries. They are unsealed batteries. They require maintenance, but that unsealing of the battery gives them more room to breathe, which translates into longer life which translates into more cycles, which translates into more cost effectiveness. And then this green line is where the Tesla Powerwall is, you know, a technology shift to lithium ion. And then if you continued it on up, you would get into high end lithium ion and then super capacitors and ultra capacitors. And this is how many cycles you get for how deep of a discharge. And the thing is, every battery, every chemical battery on the market, I can't vouch for capacitors, can't vouch for flywheels, but every chemical battery on the market, if you subject it to a deeper discharge rather than a shallower discharge, it will degrade faster. That impact is more harsh on lead acid than it is on lithium ion. That impact is harsher on low end lead acid than high end lead acid. You know, and, and this is because it's not just about the battery technology, but there are advantages to the electrolyte. There are advantages to the, the, the metal content of the cathodes and the anodes. So the build quality of the battery does make a difference in its performance. Another thing that's interesting about this is that your, your top shelf lead acid, your industrial lead acid is actually more similar in performance to lithium ion than it is to its uh, renewable lead acid peers. I thought was pretty interesting, and that's that's made me a, a big fan of um, industrial lead acid for off-grid living for quite some time now because it is cheaper than lithium-ion, but it has more cycles than introductory lead acid, and therefore it represents a nice compromise between capital expenditure and and performance, with the mindset of hey. Lithium ion battery prices are, are going to drop rapidly over the next 10 years. So, you know, why pay more now, you know, pay less now and then swap out the batteries in the years to come. 
And all of that was done with the assumption that that industrial flooded lead acid batteries cost about two hundred dollars a kilowatt hour. You know the the thing that is changing my mind on all this now is that the uh, the 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 electric vehicle market has resulted in so many uh, lightly used lithium ion batteries being put into electric vehicles wrecked and then reclaimed by the auto shop and then they sell the batteries that the price of used and used lithium ion is now substantially cheaper than new industrial flooded lead acid and that that additional performance is important when we get to discussing what's called C20 or C10 or C5 discharge rates. So let's, let's talk through some, some numbers here. You know, the Tesla Powerwall 2, you know, $6,600 of parts, 37,800 kilowatt hour warranty, that comes out to be 17 and a half cents per kilowatt hour. Industrial flooded lead acid is $200 a kilowatt hour. You know, it's rated for 2100 cycles at an 80% depth of discharge. And so that turns out to be 12 cents a kilowatt hour plus maintenance. Well, it's actually a little bit closer together because when I did this slide, I didn't account for, yeah, but the Tesla Powerwall 2 is coming with five kilowatts worth of inverter capacity that the industrial flooded lead acid is not. And that's that's worth, you know, five kilowatts worth of, of battery capacity. It's not half the price, but it might be worth $2,500, maybe a little less, maybe $2,200. And so the, the prices are a little bit closer together with the Tesla Powerwall 2 maybe being closer to 14 and a half cents. And there's, you know, the, the thing about maintenance with the lead acid battery is there's really not that much maintenance. You shouldn't be scared of lead acid battery maintenance. We're going to talk about it in a minute. But I guess the what I wanted to hammer home and, and the, the thing is, National Electric Code, sorry to, to burst people's bubbles, but National Electric Code does not allow a used electric vehicle battery being connected to a grid-tied battery inverter. It has to be listed for purpose. The only reason why I'm recommending that is because International Building Code, which is is not the same as NEC, but International Building Code says, no, that's fine. And, you know, we, we will let you repurpose electric vehicle batteries for grid-tied uses. And so, uh, you know, I, I kind of, in, in an off-grid setting, you're generally not um, subject to the same jurisdictional oversight as a grid-tied setting. And so I think that it's, it's not inappropriate to, uh, you know, particularly in an off-grid setting where the batteries are like in a garage or in a detached part of the house to uh, kind of push the, the limit if your local jurisdiction allows you to. Uh, but what I wanted to point out here is, is these are the, the, the weight per kilowatt hour of industrial flooded lead acid versus entry-level lead acid. You know, it, it weighs you know, 50% more per kilowatt hour of storage than the premium or renewable battery line. So the industrial flooded lead acid is, is substantially higher quality in terms of their, their cathodes and anodes, what goes inside the box. And that translates into a longer life, more cycles. Um, so now we're getting into battery specification sheets. And here we have, these are for lead acid, industrial lead acid. We have a five hour, a 10 hour, a 20 hour, a hundred hour amp hour rate. What on earth does that mean? Well, you know, basically your, your battery gets into diminishing returns 
the more quickly it's discharged. And so, you know, take this top line item here. At the five hour rate, the battery can output 365 amp hours. At the 20 amp hour rate, it can offset, it can generate 464 amp hours. What that means is if it's discharged fast, you know, over five hours, it's going to, the total output will be 365 versus 464. The total output will be, you know, uh, um, um, you know when you look at, at discharging over a two-hour time frame versus a 20-hour time frame, you're only going to get 60% of the energy that comes out of it, that could come out of it if it was discharged more slowly. And and so it's it's kind of like a, a funnel, you know the 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 more calm the discharge rate of that battery, the more energy you get out of it. So you know a hundred hour discharge rate, you know, if you had five days worth of battery storage, you might your average discharge rate might be C over a hundred. It's more that like on a day-to-day -day basis, your home load is going to be at one kilowatt and at other times it's going to be at 10 kilowatt. And so if you have a 100 kilowatt hour battery and your home load is at one kilowatt, you're discharging at the 100 hour rate and your battery bank has actually more storage capacity in it at that 100 hour rate than when your washer or dryer kicks on and it puts heavier demand on the battery. And so the danger with lead acid is you've got this pretty sharp shoot right here. You know, once you start getting under, they don't even give you a rating for a two hour discharge. You know, they pretty much say once you get under a five hour discharge rate, when you start exceeding that, you're not going to get any power at all out of your battery. So what does that mean? Well, let's say I have a 100 kilowatt hour battery, and I think that that is going to get me a day's worth of storage. But then I turn on 30 kilowatts of electric heat tape. You know, now my battery is going to drain in three and a half hours, and, and it's going to be doing so very inefficiently. And so the, the, the real danger with lead acid is when your battery bank starts to get smaller than a day's worth of electricity, and yet you're still trying to provide whole house backup power, that you start getting into this, this, this slope you know, between the 20-hour the discharge rate versus the 10 hour or six hour discharge rate versus anything less than that, you start sliding off the edge of the cliff. And so the, the, the short of it is, is a lead acid battery that's designed to meet the needs of an entire house for two hours and fully drain over two hours. That's not a good selection for the battery because you're going to, have, that battery is, is going to have to, because of the, the rapid rate of discharge, it's going to have to store twice as much power as the next equivalent lithium ion. But if we're talking about two or three days worth of power, you know, at that point, lead acid starts to kind of make its way back up into cost effectiveness because the battery bank is a literally larger battery bank at a, at a slower discharge rate versus a rapid discharge rate. So, you know, there are plenty of off-gridders out there living on lead acid who, you know, just sip their electricity. You know, maybe they don't have heavy-duty electrical devices. Maybe they use, maybe they cheat by using campfires for heating instead of uh, electricity. You know, I, I, I think that the most honest <laughs> off-grid home would be 100% electric, so you actually have to, um, you know, not use fossil fuels or whatever. But um, 
re- regardless, off grid. The only time that I would recommend industrial lead acid at this point is when you're doing, you know, an off grid construction residential where for code reasons or client preference, you need brand new product and your budget constraint. You know, so I, that's the only, it's a very specific instance of when I would do lead acid. Otherwise, you know, if you are, you know, other people who just want two hours of battery storage, um, you're not going to have a good time if you use lead acid. The the discharge rates will be so too much higher. This line right here, this curve is just the the kind of the the inverse of this curve right here. And so you know even even the Tesla Powerwall, when you start getting into discharge rates of under two hours, it starts to tax the limit of the technology. And that's why in the Tesla Powerwall spec sheet it only gives you the ability to drain the 13 and a half kilowatt hours in a two or three hour time frame. Now the Tesla Powerwall is actually a low end lithium ion battery that is closer to industrial flooded lead acid in terms of performance than some of the top shelf flooded lithium ion batteries. So when you get into you know, a, a commercial grid tied battery where you want to fully drain the battery as quickly as possible for peak demand management, that's when you start getting into top shelf lithium ion. You know, bottom shelf lithium ion is a, a nice choice for residential off grid. Now, if I'm doing a day's worth of energy backup power or less, you know, at this point I'm looking at lithium ion and and to reduce the cost, I'm looking at you know, use lithium ion where you're separating out the inverter hardware from the battery bank. Um, we're gonna we're gonna keep going for another four minutes or so, and then we'll take a break. We're we're at the time for our break, but I feel like I can kind of cap off this battery selection conversation real quick. Um. Batteries have different uh, charging stages, and these charging stages are more of a concern for industrial lead acid <laughs> because industrial lead acid is an unsealed battery. You know, batteries, whether they're sealed or unsealed, when batteries are charged rapidly, they produce a lot of gas. And so sealed batteries cannot be charged as rapidly as unsealed batteries of the same chemistry because a sealed battery has to contain the gas. And if you charge the battery too quickly, it can compromise the battery. The battery will start to, to bulge. The gas will force the battery shell apart, and cause it to bulge. And so there's different charging cycles that come with lead acid and unsealed lead acid to say, okay, we're going to do a, a really rapid charge when the battery's down at its bottom state to charge it back up into its more elastic range. Because there's an inflection point in these graphs, and right where this inflection point is is where the you know, the, the healthy operating range of the batteries on this side of the graph, the unhealthy operating range of the battery is on this side of the graph. And so a, a bulk charge is when the battery is way deeply discharged. And we're saying we're going to charge you all the way back up aggressively to the top. But it, it cuts out before you get to the very top. The absorbed charge is, is kind of a, a, a more gentle charge that keeps the battery up at this this um, with it operating within its elastic range yeah you know, the float charge is is being careful to once you get up to the top of the battery voltage not to apply over voltage and then there's an additional maintenance charge that takes the battery state of charge and the battery voltage and raises it way up high to the very top and as soon as you take the charge current away the battery drops back down in terms of its its voltage 
And you only do that with unsealed batteries as well. It's called an equalization charge because by overcharging those batteries, you can provide some power conditioning to keep it in, in good, healthy shape. The, the danger is when you apply too much voltage to a battery, you can break it entirely. And so the, you know, for the same reasons, you have to be more careful about rapid charges with sealed batteries. You have to be more careful about overcharging with sealed batteries. And so it, it turns out that, that even though the idea of a sealed battery is nice because there's no maintenance involved, an unsealed battery uh, can get, have a better value because the maintenance is not that big of a deal and um, you get more, you get the ability to power condition the battery for longer life and, uh, and you can have less uh, degradation due to rapid charging and discharging. So unsealed batteries cost less and last longer than sealed batteries, which is why within lead acid, I am a much more fan of unsealed than sealed. Uh, lithium ion, you don't have that option. All lithium ion batteries are sealed. So, so they, it's when you look at the charger settings of a universal inverter, uh, and you select lithium ion technology as opposed to lead acid technology, it will actually reduce the charging parameters of the battery. It'll restrict the maximum voltage of the battery to keep it within a more safe operating range. Um, lead acid batteries are heavy. Uh, there are devices out there, you know, called this is called a battery crane. Um, that you can use to, to pick up and handle batteries. You know, whenever I've dealt with industrial leaded acid on a job site, you know, I'm renting a upgraded uh, articulating fork off-road uh, to transport them. Uh, here's uh, Glenn Burt. He's, he let me use these photos. Yeah, he has a, a hoist on a ladder to pick. These are these are a, a sealed uh, flooded lead acid battery, and so he's showing you know the use of equipment to pick them up and lower them back down. And you know some of these batteries can be 800 pounds, so they're quite heavy to pick up. If you get a forklift battery, a true forklift battery, uh, you know that can be over 3,000 pounds. You know, keep in mind, uh, lift gates on trucks are only rated for 3,000 pounds. So, you know, you can get in trouble with your battery shipments, um, getting the pallet sizes to be too heavy for a lift gate truck, meaning you have to be ready with your side equipment to unload them. Uh, We'll, we'll take our break in three minutes. I'd like to keep things on the even, and I guess I talked a little more. So let me let me wrap this up. Um, here's where we're starting to get into our battery array layout. Um, it's, it's common to have only two battery circuits. And so you can get into a, well, how much storage do I need? And what's the, the maximum there is a maximum battery size that you can place on a given circuit. So here's our, our spec sheets and we're getting into, you know, here's a, a 12 volt at 85 amp hours or a four volt at 1600 amp hours. It's a little more clear on, on this one. You know, here's our, our six volts at 365, six volts at 545, that's like an upgraded one, six volts at 727 amp hours, that's an upgraded one. And then we got four volts at 1,000, and then we got two volts at 1,200, and we got four volts at 12,074, and then an upgraded one, two volts at 1,455 amp hours. And a volt times an amp is a watt. So this is saying our five hour discharge rate is, is 1500 amp hours you know, times two volts. You know, we're looking at our five hour discharge rate is three 
kilowatt hours. And so you're, you're you know three kilowatt hours for for uh, five hours is fifteen kilowatt hours at a high rate of discharge. You know if you if your loads are going to be larger than that, you need to have even more batteries, and so you might have to select you know a costlier battery. And and basically what they're doing here is saying you have a choice between high voltage and lower amperage are lower voltage and higher amperage. And uh, you can always add more batteries in series uh, to increase the voltage and use, but, but the amperage, this is at the bottom of the product line. This is as low voltage and as high of an amperage that they can possibly make this battery with lead acid technology. And so, um, you know, what happens when you max out the battery inverter is no big deal. You generally just add another battery inverter and have a separate and independently managed battery bank. It requires a higher end inverter with that kind of energy management functionality to, to manage that. So best practices when sizing batteries is to have no more than two battery circuits per battery inverter. I, in fact, prefer one battery circuit per battery inverter. Just the, the differences in lengths between uh, the top battery circuit here and the bottom battery of circuit here on how they loop back and into the battery inverter. You know, these, these battery circuits have been carefully cut and selected so that these home runs are the same length because this is such high amperage that the the a difference in length in your battery cables can result in one battery being used more heavy than the other and that will result in the heavier use battery bank ultimately failing earlier than it should and therefore dragging down the rest of the battery bank with it so the more uniformity in the system the better and when you get into multiple circuits of batteries in parallel, you get more ununiformity, disparity between the links and the battery circuits. And so uh, just keep your battery circuits the same. Um, I'm generally using fused uh, floating battery banks, and so I'm putting over current protection in each circuit anyway. And so what we're looking at is, is, you know, if we use this particular, you know, in their market leading industrial flooded lead acid battery manufacturers, most energy dense product, you know, we're looking at uh, a 12 volt battery having 1690 amp hours. And so that's in their 12 volt configuration. So at 48 volts times 1690 amp hours, we're looking at 160 kilowatt hours of lead acid storage is, is about the most you can fit onto one circuit of batteries. And so, you know, what's, what's interesting about that is if, if, I, if I had unlimited money and I did not want any reliance on a gas generator on my site, and so I wanted, you know, that that 350 kilowatt hours worth of chemical storage so I wouldn't have to use a generator ever and I'd always have electricity. Um, you know, the, the one constraint I would run into is not being able to store all of that on one battery inverter. It would be better to start dividing it up into multiple battery inverters. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, take a break. It's time. Uh, it's about 11, 12 till. Let's take a 11 or 12 minute break and we'll pick back up at the top of the hour. So let's take uh, you know 10 or 11 minutes. We'll pick back up at uh, 1 o'clock uh, central time. 
I'll put that in the chat box.
We still got a couple minutes. So I'm gonna start back up at about three. Three minutes. And get started in about a minute or so. All right. Um, welcome back. Uh, I guess what I I the <laughs> kind of de-emphasizing the the role of of lead acid uh, moving forward, but the the point is that you know this kind of curve <laughs> is a logarithmic decay curve, and the uh, so what I'm trying to say is like, you know, even if the Tesla power wall is like up here, so it's like better than lead acid, but you're, you're still getting, you're still going to get to this point where loads that are, you know, under two hours are still not even within the realm of the Tesla power wall. So, um, there's, there's, and we get this into the commercials, solar peaker class but the the highest rated discharge rate um for top shelf lithium ion is like you know 30 minutes or so um delta their lithium nickel metal cadmium in nmc it's, it's not cadmium calcium no, <laughs> I guess lithium NMC um, has a has a insanely fast uh, discharge rate. So there are nuances within uh, lithium ion which we just don't have complete time for today. It's a kind of rhyme, uh, finishing things up on lead acid. So there are there are fans of it, and I'm kind of sad to be leaving it behind. But um, there's watering kits where you put these these caps into the lead acid so that they only need to be you know, watered at one single point. You know, so 
You point, point the, the water gun, whatever, wherever it comes from. Here's the water gun. Here's the water gun. I actually just have a water gun that's on the, the end of a little squeeze tube, and I just stick one tube into a, a gallon of distilled water, and I use my little hand pump to pump the water into here. And it goes through, and it waters each battery. And this is just something that takes you know, a more than a minute of time. And it just becomes a, a, a weekly task to keep the battery water topped off. So it's it's super it's, it involves water. I mean, with batteries, it's like oh, electrical and uh, lead acid. It's like oh, am I gonna burn my fingers off um, or electrocute myself? You know, the, the main the the real maintenance is is simply connecting up uh, a tube of water and squeezing a little you know plastic bulb for a minute or so even less if you're watering them regularly you know another suggested task and uh you know this is much more useful for battery health diagnostics you know if it's not a a weekly task it is preferably a monthly task is to actually take the cap out of the battery and stick a, a hydrometer down into it take some you know, it takes a little bit of liquid out of the battery which is in general not something you want to do um, but it measures the specific gravity of the liquid, and that is the only way to adequately judge a battery's uh, health. You know, if you can monitor the voltage, but a battery's voltage is more like a, a flat table and a cliff, meaning a wall. And so it has a lot of uh, middle-of-the-road voltage range where it's hard to tell just by battery voltage if it's at a full state of charge, but it's under a heavy load, or if it's actually at a low state of discharge and it's not under a heavy load, you know, that can give you the same voltage. So uh, voltage is, is not the best way to judge battery health and state of charge. This is the main maintenance task of lead acid is, is opening up that tube, sticking something down in it, and writing down the number. It's, it's more timely. You know, it, it takes more time because you have to, you know, you have to, you can't just do it cavalier like you can with pumping water into the battery. So watering the battery is pretty easy. Uh, testing every battery uh, on a monthly basis uh, for its specific gravity is not so, um, you know, of a more enthusiastically greeted task. Uh, the battery, industrial flooded lead acid battery manufacturer I've talked to uh, is really not as worried about keeping these kinds of logs in an exact fashion. If the batteries are otherwise protected and in an environmentally controlled space, like a uh, air conditioned ventilated room, not you know a outdoor shack that rainwater can get through, um, and so so the kind of the unique takeaway is that for residential whole house off grid when you're looking for brand new so none of this used electric vehicle stuff if you're looking for brand new storage technology that is the only time i can think of to consider lead acid is when you're buying you know multiple days worth of chemical battery storage uh, for residential off-grid. And, and then it can work quite well, and there's many uh, success stories of that. Uh, my own included, um, the, the best, the best off-grid rig I have done uh, was one where the client bought you know, 122 kilowatt hours of industrial flooded lead acid storage to run a a moderately sized home 
less of a success using you know 60 kilowatt hours of storage to run a 5,000 square foot home. On, on that one, the battery was really intended to um, kind of store a few hours worth of power, you know, resolve outflow issues onto the grid and run the whole house during uh, emergencies. And uh, I don't know, it, it when the whole house surges uh, up to a 20 kilowatt load on a 60 kilowatt hour flooded lead acid battery, you know, it, it wipes out, the, <laughs> wipes out the storage capacity of the battery. And, um, and I wish I had done a, a used lithium ion instead. That's what I do in the future. Um, but new lithium ion pricing still needs to drop uh, to overtake the value for industrial flood acid off grid. If we're if we're doing an apples to apples comparison, uh, I'm not even opposed to combining multiple battery chemistries together, doing some lithium ion, some lead acid. Although um, the the thing is, is manufacturers don't really support that all too too well. Um, you know, zero maintenance batteries. Uh, the, the biggest surprise for me is that I would think by far and away a zero maintenance battery would be the better choice. What surprised me is that, you know, the battery that you have to maintain is one that will also last longer than a sealed battery. Uh, but that is kind of a moot point because as lithium ion becomes the dominant battery technology, um, all batteries will be sealed uh, in moving forward, other than big utility scale batteries. All right. Um, so inverter selection. What's up? There's a lot to consider when going from picking out a solar inverter, which is really a, a one-way street. You know, that electricity is not going from the grid up into the solar array. Uh, a solar inverter is just going from the solar array out to wherever it goes in kind of an uncontrolled manner. Uh, battery inverters are more expensive because they're more involved. Uh, they're made for, often they're made for multiple purposes, uh, and you're not using all of the features in them. So, you know, there, here's a, a, a Schneider system on the right where you could just use this inverter by itself to run, you know, a, a small house on. Or you can add another one and parallel them together. And there's a assembly block, you know, a, a service panel that's provided by the manufacturer that by and large is, despite the atrocious cost, is uh, ends up being the best option uh, for hooking these things up. The, the alternate would be to build your own box, which is a uh, ugly and a uh, painful process um, or or just knowledge of you know use some solar manufacturer's box so this is schneider's what's weird about it is it's both an ac and a dc side service panel so here's the dc breakers that the batteries are landing on and that their charge controllers are landing on and up here's the ac breakers where you know, they have a, a generator input going on. They have a grid connection going on. They have a critical load panel going on. And there's also within the inverter block itself, a transfer switch where they have the grid going in and then they have the generator going in and then they have the grid going out. And so how all of these ins and outs meet up and work together can actually become a very complicated process because it's like, okay, with a generator, do you want the generator to work with the inverter 
or do you want the generator to work independently of the inverter, you know, be isolated from it? And that can come down to a sizing issue. Like if, uh, you know, if the solar array is sized substantially larger than the generator, it could overpower the generator and, and cause the generator to stop working. Um, you know, and, and so there's, you know, and so do you want a, the whole thing to power just the grid, uh, just the backup load or the entire house? You know, you might need the additional inverter capacity so that they're stacked together. Um, this is just showing one string of batteries, but there are, are terminal lugs for, you know, two strings and Schneider actually supports up to three parallel strings. Um, and so it's a very complicated system and it turns out to be a, a quite expensive system. Uh, then there's other kinds of battery inverters that you can find that are lower end, um, which might not be UL listed. You know, like uh, there's a, a popular Chinese brand called Ames, which is CE listed. It's a listed product. It's more, it's not really recommended for whole house, but it's a, a 12 kilowatt battery inverter that is you know, more designed for like temporary power or temporary structures like uh, mobile homes and that that might have a need to switch between grid power and local a small amount of local power that are cheaper so why would you have one battery inverter 12 kilowatts for three thousand dollars and another one be you know seven kilowatts for four thousand dollars you know why why there's a huge price difference between cheap battery inverters and expensive battery inverters. And the reason is there, there are expensive battery inverters that are also listed for a grid connection. And so they can go both ways. You know, electricity goes into the battery inverter. It also comes out of the battery inverter. It's not a one way street. Um, for those kind of inverters to get along with the rest of the home's electronics, they either have to have the room all to themselves and be the, you know, the only cow in the pen, or they need to be synchronous inverters, which means they need to be able to detect an electric signal and match up with it. You know, the grid is an electric signal. A battery inverter that is grid connected uh, has a synchronous capability. You can find cheap battery inverters that are all in ones that do not have any kind of synchronous ability. And they'll have a, a AC charger from the grid and they'll have an internal grid bypass like an automatic transfer switch. And they'll also um, have, you know, their own AC separately derived output. And so there, there can be an inverter powering an entire structure that does not have any grid synchronous ability at all. You know, it's not listed for a grid connection. On the on its back side, there might be a, a AC side grid charger that's separate. That's just to keep the batteries topped off from the grid side. But everything coming out of the battery inverter is one way and that it only meets the load. So I've tried it both ways. I've tried high end uh, battery inverters that have multiple purposes and multiple functions um, that can be grid tied, that can be stackable. Um, and, and in some cases, and, and not every case does the manufacturer support this, you can combine battery inverters with other battery inverters of different manufacturers and have them in different modes of operation to do uh, different energy management things. For example, you could have a flooded lead acid battery on base load, and you could have a separate lithium ion battery inverter handling peak loads. That would, that would 
you know, elevate both parts of the system. Um, Tesla doesn't always want you to do that with their product. They you know, want you to stick to their product line. Not that it's not possible. Then there's the, the much cheaper battery inverter that, in fact, will generate a 240-volt, 120-240 split phase you know, signal and give you up to 12 kilowatts of power for $3,000, a jaw-droppingly the cheap price, um, you know, half the price of the, the quality battery inverter. And uh, the main problem with it is that it doesn't play nice with any other power source. It has to have the room all to itself. So when it, it fails, there's, you know, you, you're stuck to running on a generator. There's no double redundancy built into it. Um, and we found that, you know, there's, uh, in, in our case, and I guess it didn't make the slides, but we were, we were running the home on the cheaper model uh we were running into power quality issues when the battery would switch back and forth between grid mode and off grid mode and that um that that might have been because we were putting a tremendously high you know 5000 square foot uh electric load onto a 60 kilowatt hour flooded lead acid battery um <clears throat> and the level of power quality it was also perfectly acceptable to uh, someone committed to living off grids in the middle of the woods. This was a, a high-end home, and it was causing voltage flicker in their LED lights. So we swapped it out and went with the, the grid-tied battery inverter uh, because the grid connection was there, and it, it resolved the power quality issue. So... Um, I, I would stick to to the grid tied battery inverter product class uh, as opposed to the all in ones. Um, I would stick to the more expensive battery inverter components than the cheap battery inverter components. So it's kind of the the last place to cut project budget is in the quality of the battery inverter itself, as well as its balance of system components. And so this was, this was an issue that I actually debated and went back and forth on uh, for quite some time uh, because, you know, there, these battery inverter components are quite expensive um to begin with and uh you know ultimately uh i've had great experiences whenever using the higher end battery inverter component products and i've had experiences where you know yes it works but there's a lot more troubleshooting involved and a lot more risk involved when things do go wrong with the uh the lower end uh range of battery inverters Um, so here I'm, I'm kind of debating the, the merits of that, but, uh, you know, basically what we're saying is, is what is, what is the, the merits of going off grid and, uh, you know, like it may be in, in my specific case where my cooperative is basically making me pony up an additional $8,000 onto my interconnection so I can generate enough revenue to offset their monthly interconnection fees due to their terrible solar policy. And, um, you know, maybe I'm adding an additional uh, premium because I'm not just buying a solar inverter, I'm buying a solar battery inverter. And then, you know, the... This is, I would say, 50 kilowatt hours of industrial flooded lead acid is, is too small, you know, for the smallest possible system. You know, I would say that, that you know, you need a, at least, you know, 100 kilowatt hours, you know, at least twice that amount. 
And so you're looking at just to take a, a standard solar project and convert it into like an off-grid residential solar project, you know, you're easily looking at, you know, an additional $40,000 uh, in total. You know, kind of for an for entry-level off-grid system. And so I, you know, I think what most people are going to opt for instead is, is like a smaller lithium ion battery that'll do in a pinch and a, a traditional gas generator, uh, at least until lithium ion battery prices, uh, begin to make more, uh, take more market. Um, there are different modes of operation for these battery inverters um, that are that are kind of interesting. Uh, we're getting into further into the documents here. We see, you know, they it gives us a, a minimum uh, battery bank size. So, you know, they're they're saying, okay, the the minimum battery bank we support is 440 amp hours. What does that mean? Well, if you're doing a 48 volt battery configuration, uh, which you probably are if you're buying this particular inverter because that's its highest voltage operation, um, and generally using higher voltages is the most cost effective configuration. If you're buying a, a battery component and it says we work at 24 volts and we also work at 48 volts, uh, designing the system around the 48 volt option uh, nine times out of 10 is going to be the more cost effective choice. So they're saying, okay, well, the minimum flooded lead acid bank you can put on us is a 20 kilowatt hour flooded lead acid. And so, um, So that's kind of interesting because if I can get that for two hundred dollars a kilowatt hour, you know, that's four thousand dollars of industrial flood acid plus maybe a thousand dollars of additional, you know, uh, balance of system material, maybe even more. And so you're looking at maybe and, and then labor, and then the premium to go from the non-battery inverter to the battery inverter. So even doing the the kind of cheapest uh, battery expansion onto a batteryless solar array, you know, you're looking at ten thousand dollars just for the smallest of of cheapest batteries. To where you know forty thousand dollars and making a stab at at off grid, you know, there's some people who would spend the money to uh, play around with their electricity like that. And you know it's it's not unheard of for customers to get into situations where the utility is charging them around that much to bring the power out to their property. So the the next kind of fundamental design choice is: um, Are you going to do DC coupling or AC coupling? And you know what I have come to realize is that this debate is really overplayed. Um, there are some merits to DC coupling. Um, AC coupling is commonplace. And what is more important is that when you do AC coupling, that you do it in a way for the entire system to work together. And often that'll mean uh, picking one inverter platform and using it for both the solar array and the battery inverter. And uh, that might not be the most cost optimal way to do it, but it is a quality way to do it. Um, the purists say that DC has some technical advantages and the technical advantages is about black starting the solar array. And so the, the problem is so when you when you AC couple and the sun goes down, you know the the solar inverter needs to be able to see the grid to start back up again. 
And the problem is, is if your battery is fully drain and your battery inverter can't start up again, then the solar array comes up, but your solar inverter is still off. And so, you know, the, the danger is that, well, with AC coupling, your solar array might turn off and not be able to turn back on again. Um, I think that technology has, has pretty much eliminated that uh, argument. What they do is they keep a reserve capacity that you program in. So, you know, or, or they have a, a generator, you know, on backup to prevent that from happening to begin with. So there's a number of ways to solve that fatal flaw of AC coupling. And there's many advantages of AC coupling too in, in that, you know, sometimes you get into higher voltages and then you can also place the, bat the, the actual battery inverter wherever you want. You know, so the battery inverter could be inside the house at the electric service panel and solar array can remain on the outside and, and the space requirements are therefore divided up into smaller <laughs> spaces apart than one big giant space that might not be feasible together. You know, with, with DC coupling, the, the technical advantage is that you can you know, better match the voltages between the solar array and the battery bank and the battery bank and the service panel. And there's been some companies that have been successful in doing that. Uh, Pica is uh, one that was bought by Generac, actually, a battery inverter that did just that. Um, so there might be some, some technical advantages, but it, it all comes down to the same reason why we use the grid as AC uh, even though all of our electronics and batteries are, are DC um, and, and we deal with the inefficiencies of power inversion. And uh, the, the reason is it's just it's cheaper to transform electricity with AC uh, than it has been traditionally with, with DC, at least of voltage regulators of this size and magnitude. Uh, and, and at the same time, we've had a lot of uh, time and investment put into this kind of AC inverter architecture and not the same amount of production investment has been put into uh, the, the DC side charge controllers. There's some products out there, but not, not many. Um, and, and so the the DC charge controllers cost more per watt of value than, than even a full AC to DC inverter. And maybe, you know, with the, the right, you know, manufacturer that could be different and DC charge controllers, you know, could come triumphantly back and, and make big inroads. And in a sense, they kind of do with, with solar edge, uh, in, in a sense, uh, Solar Edge is a DC charge controller behind every solar panel on the rooftop. Um, and so it's not like DC coupling is going away, but you know, generally you're just doing whatever the battery inverter manufacturer is telling you to do. And, and there's many installers who uh, swear by AC coupling, even though DC coupling uh, might have the better technical advantage and it really doesn't matter because you can also do both. So you can have, you know, some DC coupled batteries and some AC coupled batteries. And furthermore, you know, regardless of what you're doing, you know, the good design practice is to have another power resource on site like a generator. And so the generator can be there to help you uh, charge up the batteries in the event that the system's fully discharged. Yeah, on top of that, you know, the, the Sunny Boy is a, a solar inverter that has a dedicated AC output built into it, and that could be wired up to a AC charger to charge the battery. So there's so many different ways to solve the black start issue without doing DC coupling. Um, when you get into DC coupling, 
You say, <laughs> forget all that. I want to do charge controllers. Like technically, they should be the better product because there's less uh, steps to manage the electricity to get to the final product. Um, it starts to become real interesting because charge controllers are different than inver solar inverters. You know, solar inverters are designed to take every kilowatt hour that comes out of the array and do something with it. Um, whereas a, a solar charge controller is more concerned about the battery itself than it is about taking every volt out of the array it possibly can. And so charge controllers are more about monitoring the, the battery state of charge and, and then charging it in a way that that is best for the battery, assuming that it can be fed with a power supply rather than than you know starting with the power supply and trying to force every kilowatt hour out of it. And so you know if your batteries are fully charged and your solar array is going into a charge controller, it's only going to be putting in as much power into the battery bank as the system needs. So you're going to be, you know, trying to check your system and, and reading it and being like, well, why, <laughs> this is a five kilowatt array. Why aren't my charge controllers doing anything? And it's, a, oh, it's because your batteries are, are fully topped off and you don't have much electrical load going on. And so there's no need, even though it's the middle of the day, there's no need for the charge controller to be exporting power into the system. Um, they're, they're also, you have to watch out for the voltage levels of charge controllers um, because many of them are only for 150 or 300 volts, and, and that's for the solar input. And that can surprise a lot of solar installers because they're used to installing 600-volt circuits. And so when you get into 300-volt design, circuit design, instead of 600-volt, for the same amount of power, you have have half the voltage, you have twice the amperage. And so you get into uh, shorter circuits and, and numerous circuits. So I select a, a 600 volt charge controller to go with a 600 volt solar array so that I can minimize the, the number of circuits. Um, the most cost effective uh, charge controller on the market that I've found so far is able to take advantage of a 300 volt standard. So, um, you know, it is probably the more preferred one as well. So, you know, just, just be aware that you can get charge controllers at different voltages. And that might mean that you've been designing solar arrays where one eight kilowatt array only has three circuits on it. Then you move down to a 300 volt charge controller and all of a sudden that same array needs twice as many circuits. Now, National Electric Code has uh, kind of taken a stance and, and from left field said, well, we need voltage regulators on every single solar panel up on the rooftop. And one of the, the impacts of it is these larger charge controllers have, lar have kind of vanished from um, grid-tied residential design. And so these are more popular when you get into in, to ground mounting where all the electronics and the solar array are mounted on the side of the home. You don't get into rapid shutdown requirements and that kind of enables you to select charge controllers um, if you so choose. Um, what, is, what is sneaky about getting too far into the DC product selection. So let's say you, you really like charge controllers because, you know, going from a DC solar array to a, a DC charge controller to a DC battery, it's fewer steps, better processing. You know, you want, you want the, the old school way to do it. <laughs> um, that's fine, but then finding high voltage DC breakers becomes an issue. And so here's a, 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 D, a 100 amp DC breaker. This is an 80 amp charge controller. It needs to go on a 100 amp breaker. And this, this 600 volt, 100 amp 
Breaker, DC Breaker, Schneider's trying to charge a hundred dollars for. And so, you know, I I I ended up finding the original equipment manufacturer, and I found a, a, a triple ganged breaker to get me three uh, single pole breaker connections on three charge controllers for fifty bucks instead of a uh, three hundred. But that's where it's it's just you get into doing the the DC side of the design, thinking that you're optimizing something or, or gaining points technically, and your access to DC side balance of system equipment uh, evaporates rather quickly. It becomes quite expensive. So I don't know. I've I've mainly do DC coupled solar arrays, um, <laughs> but I I buy the arguments of the AC side uh, AC coupling as well. The fact is, if you're if you're putting the solar array on the rooftop. National Electric Code all but mandates that you're going to have an AC coupled solar array because uh, you know whether you're using in phase microinverters or DC solar optimizers to meet the rapid shutdown requirements, you're either using the in phase system or the solar edge system, and um, the in phase by its nature, uh, inverter on the rooftop means you're going to AC couple. So solar edge, you know they do both. You know, they have a kind of a DC coupled battery can also be an AC coupled battery. So let's talk about the uh, control room layout. Um, space around uh, electrical equipment. You know, really the, the only trouble with this particular room is that the, the storage area in front of it can't be used as storage. When you're planning out your electrical room, the best rule of thumb if you don't know the, the code requirements, which are very real, um, imagine a worker standing in front of the equipment and fully standing up, not crouching, you know, standing up and he's working comfortably. And that's the space that you need in the room for every serviceable part. And none of that space can be shared with other kinds of, of non-electrical scope like plumbing or, or gas or things like that. And so technically, you know, this air conditioner duct, you're like, well, isn't that, isn't that HVAC scope? Isn't that a shared space? Well, actually it's not because the shared space is for one person. And so it ends at about six feet and that's where the air conditioning duct comes in. You know, these, this, this gas and water line is kept off to the side of the service equipment. So, you know, one person can stand right here. But that, that room where the batteries need to be, particularly if they're unsealed batteries, it needs to be serviceable. Um, unsealed batteries are required to be in a ventilated room. Um, this is where NEC is actually less conservative than uh, International Building Code. International Building Code requires the ventilation to be continuous. Um, the NEC just requires ventilation. Um, So uh, there are greater ventilation requirements for uh, user critical rooms. Um, higher voltage systems uh, start to require different signage on the doors. Um, sealed batteries don't require ventilation. Um, so here's NEC given the choice of one of the following, continuous ventilation, or, um, you know, non-continuous, but a larger amount of ventilation, I presume. Um, oh, different firewall requirements for uh, educational rooms, 
prisons, healthcare systems, daycare systems. Um, you have stronger firewall requirement. Um, when the battery volume <laughs> gets sufficiently large, you know, over a thousand gallons. Um, so I guess that's that's really larger than a residential array. Uh, you got have additional space requirements. You know, do you have to temperature regulate batteries? You know, I, I hear that as a, or, and I've made it as an argument in support of lead acid having a, a larger temperature range than lithium ion, but that's not really true. I mean, the truth of the matter is you want to keep your batteries in the most temperature regulated environment possible. And so, you know, the best, the best lead acid batteries I have seen have been always been in conditioned, enclosed, dry rooms rather than uh, boxes built off to the side. Uh, boxes built off to the side are a popular option because it takes the danger out of the house. So it's they're not they're not a bad deal, but you know. Not just the batteries, but your battery inverter equipment um, degrades at higher heat. And so there's just going to be overall performance gains from keeping them inside. On top of that, the battery inverters are more, uh, there's a lot more stuff going on inside them than a regular solar inverter. And so not all... Uh, Battery inverters are as rugged as solar inverters. Um, you know, Schneider's, for example, is a NEMA 1 inverter. So it has to go inside. It, it can't go outside. So, yeah, that can surprise a solar installer who is used to everything having, you know, tremendous environmental ratings. Uh, a common spot where I see batteries installed is inside garages. And, and then that's not a, a terrible spot for them, although, you know, inside an air-conditioned space would be best. As temperature does impact batteries in, in a negative manner, you know, the, uh, the warmer the battery is, the shorter its life will be. Oddly enough, it, it gains a little bit of storage capacity <laughs> the warmer it is as well. So uh, you know, let's say you have to live off grid and you have to use the cheapest, best option. So you're going with uh, lead ass, industrial lead acid today, new. Uh, what's, what's interesting about this, these two battery rooms is they both violate code. Uh, you need to be able to access these cells for these unsealed batteries for servicing. And so these cells tucked away from this wall, you can't access. You, know, you need to access the service panel for servicing, and you have to lean over these batteries to do that. There's a, a six-inch depth clearance requirement. So no more a uh, 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 Electronic box can overhang another electronic box, but by no more than six inches uh, to prevent you from having to kind of lean over and stumble into um, live electronics. There's also a, a space requirement of, of clearance between a wall and uh, uh, the electronics as well that this is probably in violation of. So I, th I think the... The main thing is that you know solar installers or solar designers are used to dealing with one uh, small inverter for the entire system. But now you might have you know one battery inverter today, you know, three battery inverters tomorrow if you want to you know maybe do a critical load backup today and a full off-grid conversion in the years to come. And all of these components will need a three and a half foot working space in front of them of a six and a half foot tall working space in front of them. And so 
you know, what what surprised me in in trying to locate these things in the building is you know trying to hug them up all in one spot against the wall uh, turns out to requires a lot of wall space. Um, we're gonna come back to this in a in a minute. We kind of we kind of talked about the maintenance tasks um, already, so this slide probably uh, can come out. Uh, but let's let's just take a look at at the the inverter wall and how much space that entails. You know these uh, these solar inverters haven't gone through as much uh, you know product design as their batteryless peers. So this is like a, a seven kilowatt inverter, and this is a seven kilowatt inverter, and it takes about twice as much space as you know what would be a, a 14 kilowatt batteryless inverter. So the the battery inverter components are about twice as big. You know now you need uh, a special service panel, you know, because this this service panel is the one where it's taken the the DC side from the charge controllers and then the AC side from the double stacked inverters and then out to the grid and then out to the generator and then out to the critical load panel. So this is a, a special service panel that is in addition to the electric service panel. And so you have your your switch gear panel plus an inverter that is twice as large as the solar inverters you're used to designing with. And then on top of that, you either need the the DC charge controllers or the AC coupled solar array. So you need the 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 you know the the PV side of things and then you have the battery side of things. And then you have the the you know connection point, and it, it takes up you're looking at three times the amount of space as a traditional solar array, and so you know installers are used to just going up and being able to find a location on the side of a building where to hang the solar inverter. Um, it becomes a little harder to locate this stuff inside the uh, house, so the common compromise is to put them inside a garage and often installers will hang a cage directly in front of it to provide mechanical protection um, along the side wall of a garage kind of between the wall and the uh, uh, garage door um, if you go with industrial leaded acid, lead acid, just don't get surprised. You know these are are three foot long, um, you know two foot tall, ten in, one foot wide batteries that weigh a thousand pounds each. They're quite heavy. You know, the batteries ship, you know, charged. So you know maybe not fully charged, but but they're live. So you have to think about that when you're hoisting them. Uh, with chains. And so uh, code actually, this is this is what I would say is the requirement for um, to use new batteries in uh, electric code. It says storage batteries and battery management equipment shall be listed. Uh, this requirement shall not apply to lead acid batteries. So this is telling me that you know it, it could be code compliant to use a used forklift battery to power a house, but it would not be code compliant to use a used electric vehicle battery to power a house. Um, and that's that's where you know international building code has said no we're actually going to allow uh, electric vehicle batteries to be repurposed um but that's so you know um let's see disconnecting means uh 
you know, generally they're at that, these are for higher voltage systems, but you're going to want disconnects, you know, at, you know, wherever you want, wherever you're supposed to service some equipment, you want to disconnect before it so that you can get into it, work on it powered down. Um, also for, for safety, like when you go through a wall to another room, uh, you know, these are, are given special, you know, consideration and the disconnects will need to be placed on both sides of the wall. Um, here's, here's another one for, for planning. Like, let's say you plan on just putting these heavy batteries down on the floor. Um, the the support structure for the batteries cannot be conductive and concrete is considered conductive a metal shelf is considered conductive and so if you're setting the uh, batteries directly down on concrete or directly onto a metal shelf you need to put a, a padding down like a rubber padding uh, for them to sit on top of Let's see. Um, there is a section of National Electric Code for energy storage systems, and there are more requirements for um, um, higher voltage systems than lower voltage. So that's another thing that's been driving kind of this lead acid 48 volt standard is there's been less regulations on it than higher voltage systems. Um, you know, whether or not that's a good thing for your site really depends on, on your job site. You know, if it's in an urban environment or if you're trying to tinker in a rural environment, uh, battery racks shall have a one inch clearance between the cell container and the wall. You know, that's just a, a good practice uh, even for lower voltage batteries as well uh, the door should open outward from the battery room um, illumination you know the you know this is it's kind of funny but you know if you're if you're having a power outage issue and you need to see inside your battery room and you don't have any light uh, you're going to get really mad at whoever designed the solar system because uh, there's, there's no lights on and you need to service this, the array. So, you know, don't neglect how you're going to illuminate that workspace. And I would even have it on a, on a, its own, you know, battery powered light. You know, DC circuits um, inside of buildings at least on the solar end are required to be run inside of metal. And so, and, and battery rooms of unsealed batteries are um, corrosive. And so if you're using an unsealed battery in a battery room that's inside the building, you know, even though it's coincidentally the, the most expensive uh, type of conduit, there is a, a plastic wrapped, metal conduit that is great for for lead acid battery rooms because you get that anti-corrosive protection and you get the inside metal physical protection of the conductors um, if you're outside the building you can just be in in plastic conduit rather than metal if you're using metal conduit in a battery room you'd want to paint the metal uh, to prevent corrosion, uh, and that's kind of why we're being reminded in our battery support system that painted metal, uh, you might have reason to have painted metal inside your battery room if you're building a metallic paint uh, structure, but that paint alone shall not be considered the insulating material between the battery and the support structure. Um, you know, DC circuits are, are marked and labeled, um, 
you know, the, the most important part of your battery room is guarding against accidental contact. So, you know, these battery inverters have terminals where your DC conductors are being lugged onto it, almost like a industrial site uh, bus bars on their uh, main, you know, 800 amp service panel. You know, the only ones you can crawl inside and have giant bus bars on. Um, and so you're going to have terminals that are hot. And sometimes I've had customers kind of, you know, express kind of some, some shock that they can, you know, and this is again, when you get into, um, you know, what kind of system are you designing? Are you designing the component or the complete box? Um, you know, where they can see the lug and they say, well, if I, if I touch that lug on that battery, you know, can I electrocute myself? And it's, you know, you, it, I mean, it depends if you complete the circuit. Yes. And so you have to be very careful around batteries. You don't want to get gung ho with your metal tools and drop it into the battery and connect leads together. And, you know, that could be quite dangerous. So, you know, these, these battery rooms need to be secure. And so, you know, whether it be a, a locked cage or cabinet inside a garage uh, or a locked room that's dedicated to the home electronics, but, uh, you know, by, by some way, the uh, system needs to be protected. Um, you know, when output terminals are more than five feet from the equipment or where the terminals pass through a wall, um, they need to have a, a disconnecting means for the battery at the end of the circuit. Um, and then a second disconnecting means if the equipment is not within sight. You know, and so basically when I'm like trying to pass a national electric code class and I get to those disconnect requirements, you know, if it has something to do with, you know, on-site power, you know, they're going to want to see a, the person who's operating the equipment is want to, going to want to be able to visually assess if the system's turned on or off. You know, the solar industry is lucky that we're not required to put these disconnect switches up on the rooftop. You, know, you can overdo it like they do in Australia, and it can become a, a hazard. But uh, the general rule of thumb is if you're dealing with an on-site power system, and that those conductors are coming through, you need to be able to see if they're on or off. Um, there are differences between emergency power systems and standby power systems. So emergency power systems deal with life critical issues, uh, whereas standby you know, your building loses power, you know, you don't have power and you wait for it to come back on. Uh, that might get into uh, redundancy requirements in the power system or the strength of the conduit. Um, so just don't be unaware if you're designing an off-grid system and someone's talking about emergency power for medical equipment, uh, you might need to, to check what your design is supposed to designed to or emergency standards or standby standards. Um, automatic transfer equipment, the full load. So the standby source um, shall be capable of supplying the full connected load. Now that's kind of interesting. What that says is, you know, if I'm solar edge and I'm, Automatic, the power goes out, and I'm automatically transferring my, you know, 25 amp dedicated output to a 200 amp service panel. You know, that could be a national electric code violation. You know, saying that, you know, I can I can power my, you know, my standby generator needs to be sized to power the appropriate load. 
You know, so we have these code compliant critical load panels, not just to power the critical load, but to say, look, you know, you know, this is the system's going to work as intended because code is saying to connect this standby generator, I need automatically, I need to have it sized to fit the load. If I was doing a, a manual transfer switch, you know, I can have a 30 amp generator powering the whole house because, you know, I, I presume they're, saying someone's there manually flicking the switch and so there's some level of competency uh, going on down there. You know, automatic transfer switch has to be sized to fit the load. Um, it's kind of moving on. I think we've, we've got, yeah, we got here already. Uh, so guarded the the batteries and the and in in some cases the especially when you're using cheap parts not just the batteries but the battery inverters you know the rest of the equipment you know should be guarded against accidental contact you know that might mean that the room needs to be locked and so if you're planning on putting, say, your battery room in a utility closet, you know, but it's a large, you know, laundry room, you know, you need to think about, well, if who's going to be in that laundry room? Is any, you know, are unqualified people going to be in that laundry room? You know, that might say, okay, well, it's time to put the, the system, you know, have its own physical barrier that protects it. Um, yeah, I'm not, the bonding system, uh, you know, your inverter is, is connected to ground. I'm, I'm not really sure where I was going with this slide. Um, well, I guess, I guess the, what I'm trying to say here is, you know, the utility is grounded out at their transformer. And then um, the home has its own grounding electrode. And so the, the, you might be surprised that you know, your, your grounding electrode system needs a, uh, you know, a, a, your grounding electrode plus a supplemental electrode. So, don't you, I guess what I'm saying is in your off-grid designs, you're going to be the one responsible for grounding your your ground rods, or driving your providing your ground rods. Okay, kind of closing in on on the day. Um. Actually made some pretty good timing. We'll take another five minutes and get into some, you know, save some time for tomorrow. Um, so now we're just going to cover some finer notes on racking. You know, this is just a, kind of assuming that you are, are – um, Further along in your solar design expertise, here are some additional bits of knowledge to uh, not forget. Now, when looking at your your spacing between your your positive attachments, when I get to the inside of my solar array, I start staggering my L feet, and if the rail is rated for a longer span. You know, sometimes they can be rated for a eight foot span. So you can span, you know, not just every other rafter, but every three rafters. You span every three rafters instead of every other rafter. You make fewer penetrations in the roof, spend less time on the roof, spend less materials. It's just as good. So long as, you know, when I'm, when I'm installing multiple rows of panels, you know, I can skip every three rafters, but still hit every single rafter with an attachment point as I go up the rooftop. So on sufficiently large arrays in the interior of the roof, I'll start staggering my L feet out, um, still evenly distributing the load over the roof. You know, just 
optimizing the strength of my materials. Where you want to especially reinforce, where you want to put additional attachments, even if the you know design might not have originally put it in, is the corners of the array. The corners of the array experience the greatest amount of wind. And, and similarly, in areas of very heavy snow, I'm not just saying regular snowfall. You know, I'm not saying areas where it might not snow every year. I'm talking, or even areas where it does snow every year. I'm talking about like, like upstate New York, you know, Wisconsin, Minnesota, you know, areas where you might get, you know, a couple feet of snow on the rooftop is not unrealistic. Uh, reinforcing the very bottom edge of the rail. Um, what that does is it is it redistributes the downforce on these attachments and the, the bottom rail, when a bunch of snow is sitting up on top of the array, that bottom rail becomes the heaviest. And so giving it additional attachment points prevents the uh, weight of the array from crushing the uh, solar array through the roof. Um, this is, I, I think about aesthetics in my design. So this is a design I got from a, a developer. And um, you know, we, we ultimately you know, looked up at this side of the roof and said, you know, underneath this top of the roof here, if we drive our lag screws through it, um, you know, that's just an open loft space that you can see from the living room. You know, we're not, you know, that's that's not, <laughs> we're not going to do that with our, our lag screws. And uh, it was also a steeper slope that wasn't picked up in their initial satellite image-based sales process. And so we, we kept the array out along the bottom edge of the roof and, and made it, A, we made it symmetrical to fit the roof line. Um, you know, the way we didn't sell this project, but, you know, it probably would have looked better without, without the four modules. Um, although we kind of, I don't know, I think it looks pretty cheerful. Um, Another difference is this design called for subarray subsections, and that would have required either ugly conduit going across the rooftop or an internal conduit run um, between sections. So that would have meant if you're going to use an internal conduit run, you've got to put a hole in the roof. If you have two subarray sections, that means you've got to put two holes in the roof. This is a metal roof. We don't want to. We don't want to do that too much. And so what we, and I love internal conduit runs because I think they look so much better. So what we ended up doing is making it one continuous array. So we avoid having the jump between subarray sections and then kind of down at the bottom of the roof in this kind of attic section, that's where we drilled into the roof, you know, piped it, flashed it, whatever, but went into the roof at that point. Um, so it was a point selected to you know, for accessibility and, uh, oh, it's, it's like these two arrays cost the same amount of money, but one is very ugly and does bad things to the roof and the other looks good. Um, and, you know, hopefully the value stays with the, um, you know, stays with it. Okay. So, uh, One, one more note, I guess. Um, when I select my racking, I select it with a little U channel coming out the top. Some of the solar rails will have the channel, I guess, along the side right here. And the, the solar cables get kind of pressed into the side here and then tie wrapped together. I like laying them in to this top channel. Uh, the only caveat being this top channel can accumulate water, so you have to drill little weep holes through the, the racking uh, to, to stop that from happening. But by putting the, the rail into this channel, the, the modules go on top, 
and that mod the clamp for the module secures the rail into the channel and so i know that that rail is protected for the years to come and it won't go anywhere you know where, whereas leaving the cables loose and exposed underneath the roof is a little unsightly um you know so here here we have you know module level panel electronics you know, these are voltage regulators that go up behind every solar module and they add a lot of wiring underneath the array because you know every module plugs into them and the module lips aren't sized for the optimizer so there's a lot of slack and then the optimizer to optimizer slack is there because they're designed for both portrait and landscape and so you're you have loose cable upon loose cable right up on the roof where it's very hard to manage you know, what I do is I take, you know, this U channel and I measure out on the ground where every optimizer is going to go on that rail. And we build it all on the ground with all the cable pre-managed before lifting these sections up to the rooftop. Um, we're, we're approaching, we're a little ahead of ourselves in content. We're approaching the end of the program. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read over uh, a couple of key things to remember, uh, and then I'm going to pass it back to Half Moon. Um, what we learned today was, uh, you know, PV watts can tell us based off the solar insulation data uh, whether or not it's a cloudy day or a sunny day. That can provide us with some site data. We learned that uh, lead acid batteries uh, decay curve is like logarithmic which is the quicker and the faster the battery discharges the the more much more grossly inefficient the system becomes um and because of that logarithmic decay curve we um you know we really don't want to use lead acid for you know a two hour three hour battery in fact it really is only now having tremendous value uh, or not even tremendous value, some value in residential whole house off-grid. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a quiz question, which we really didn't get into, which is which of these is least similar in function. It has some DC side issues and AC side issues. And the point was um, a, a inverter that can take, you know, a DC input current and convert it to an AC output current it has more stuff going on than one that that regulates a DC to DC voltage. It's not that great of a quiz question, but the answer is variable DC inverter slash AC output. Uh, we talked about code requirements for metal conduit with DC circuits. Um, There's a, a quiz question that's when the batteries and inverters are located on separate sides of the wall, where should the disconnect be located? And um, the, the answer is on the battery side of the wall. Um, and then the, let's see, we got, we got two more things to note. Um, so the battery side of the wall, uh, I, I guess I didn't get the picture of it in our battery room. It probably is coming later on in the program when we're done with uh, the generator discussion. But what we ended up doing with our the, the optimal battery room layout, I guess it's gonna start it now because now we're gonna run over a little bit. So sorry for running over a minute. Um, what we found to be the optimal battery layout for uh, sealed or for unsealed lead acid is to take the the short end of the battery bank and then kind of put it up against the wall like so with the three and a half feet clearance between the wall so that you could walk around all sides of the battery bank. So the most compact 
in battery room for these unsealed battery banks is to put the short end up against the wall. Um, the last quiz questions are, are more conceptual. Um, uh, and, and so I'm just going to go through them because we didn't really get to this part of the discussion. Um, you know, most homes have around a 10 kilowatt peak electrical demand unless they have some kind of um, extreme instantaneous electric heating. So like a tankless water heater is going to be much more than that. But if they have a tank water heater, you know, a 10 kilowatt load uh, is is what most homes are getting up to on a day in and day out basis. If they have a tankless water heater, then their power level is much more, like twice that, 20 kilowatts. Um, using the, in a battery system, whichever uses the batteries the least amount is going to have the longest life. So doing electrical, heavy electrical loads in the middle of the day when the sun is up is actually better for the batteries than a more uniform load spread throughout the day and night. And then in, and for most customers in the U.S., not Alaska, you know, not, not the very north part of the United States, but for most customers in the U.S., um, buying batteries is going to be the more cost-effective option than uh, relying on a generator every day in the wintertime. Uh, so I hope you absorb some of that. We're going to pick it back up tomorrow. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it back to Half Moon. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, JR, for all your information and insight uh, this afternoon. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Remember, your quiz will be sent to your email here shortly. Uh, once you have successfully passed the quiz, uh, you'll have access to your certificate. If you don't, don't pass the quiz right away, you will be able to retake it until you do receive a passing grade. And we are finished then for the day and we'll reconvene tomorrow again at 11 a.m. Central Time. Again, thanks everyone for being here and see most of you tomorrow.